energy sector amid a global pandemic. For the energy sector in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao, the Bangsamoro is blessed and given a chance through the RA 1154 or the BOL, the power and authority over the energy sector within the jurisdiction of the barn, specifically the Ministry of Environment, Natural Resources, and Energy. However, we acknowledge that the journey may be challenging, yet exciting, because of our region's potential energy resources the power and the number of natural energy sources within the jurisdiction of the barn. The, specifically, the Ministry of the Environment to the territorial resources and energy. Ultimately, it is the interest of the BARM and the Philippine government that will reap from all these blessings that God has given to us. However, there are always many hurdles and challenges involved in it. It requires patience and perseverance to overcome them. Moreover, considering the energy sector in the BARM is new to us, it consists of several thematic areas, such as renewable energy industry, electric power industry, oil and gas and industry, and therefore Bangsamoro should be aligned with it, not to mention the different energy conservation laws, policies, and programs that consistent with the national law. Nonetheless, we are exerting all our efforts to acquire and learn everything related to energy, to fully understand different contexts and services of the Philippines energy sector. That is why we still need guidance and assistance from the national government to help us build and operationalize the energy sector in the bar. We are looking forward to working closely with both government, especially the Department of Energy and its attached agencies and the private sector as well. We are hopeful for more collaboration and cooperation in the future and achieving sustainable development, economic prosperity, and peace and security without harming our environment. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you at isang magkakalikasang umaga po sa ating lahat. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat and shukran po, Director Abbas of Menra. Next, it's already um, it's, uh, it's 10.18. The next part of the program, we will, be, uh, we will have ASEC Montenegro to set the context for all of these activities we've been doing for the uh, energy sector and the uh, stakeholders of the energy sector for Mindanao. And after that, we will have a, a backgrounder and launching of two projects um, involving the uh, support from the European Union for the energy sector of Mindanao. After which, um, we also have a, an introduction of the Energy Secure Philippines, a project being funded and supported by USAID. And then we will be breaking up for lunch break. During the lunch break, we will be featuring several videos, informative videos of ongoing projects that we have here for Mindanao in the energy sector, especially for renewable energies. And then this afternoon, we will have the um, technical discussions, so just so you know, um, just, so you are, uh, just so we are setting the expectations for today's program. Now, before we proceed to the uh, next part of the program by ASEC Montenegro, can we just have a, 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 a picture taking? Okay. I would like to request everyone to turn on your video cameras for the picture taking. Okay. Just so we can record all the participants, not just the speakers for today's event. Um, James, uh, James will do the. Uh, picture taking. So um, James, are you ready? Because people are going to hold their smiles for about three seconds. Okay, so everybody smile for the camera in three, two, one. Okay, James, are we good? Box, there are 19 um, pages pa. So it may take a few more minutes. Okay. Just keep your smiles, okay? But don't hold your breaths. This is probably the uh, a record breaking event for Minda. 500 plus participants in Zoom, not including all the viewers that we have out there on Facebook. And we Ladies and gentlemen, we really, really appreciate you coming over and joining us. All of you, all the stakeholders, all Mindanaoans are very, very important um, in, in forwarding 
the interest of all Mindanaoans for a reliable and sustainable energy sector for Mindanao. Okay, uh, James Lee's just gave us a feedback and he's done with a picture taking all 19 pages of it. Thank you very much. Okay, so next up, um, we will be talking about um, um, setting the context for the energy sector in Mindanao. Now, it's very, very important to set the context where we are right now, what do we uh, want to do to achieve the vision that we have, not just for the energy sector in Mindanao, but for the whole social economic landscape of Mindanao. Because at the end of the day, we're not improving things just to improve the power sector, but we are trying to improve the overall quality of life of all Mindanaoans. And to give us that context, very, very important context, so we can tie everything up, all the things that we're doing for Mindanao, let us all welcome Assistant Secretary uh, Romeo Montenegro, the Deputy Executive Director of the Mindanao Development Authority. Sir, you are live. Thank you, Mox, and uh, good morning, everyone. To uh, Secretary Mani, Chair of the Mindanao Development Authority, Undersecretary uh, Mani Waneza, also of um, the Department of Energy, and uh, Chairperson Agnes uh, Ivanadera, and um, our representative from uh, the Bar Menre, um, representing Minister Makapua. Um, Members of the energy sector um, from the private government uh, um, institutions uh, in Mindanao that um, through this time and through the years had been closely collaborating with us um, essentially to um, look at, uh, discuss, and uh, find a way forward for addressing the Mindanao power situation since um, several years ago. And uh, this part of um, this morning's um, program, uh, my presentation essentially would just respond to a question, why are we here? Um, for those that have uh, just um, logged in and trying to explore and understand what is likely to be talked about in today's um, Mindanao Power Forum, let me um, lay down the, the context for um, additional um, appreciation of uh, the question, why do we need to do what we are doing here today. Many of you uh, about nine years ago uh, have been part and were there when we slated in collaboration with the Department of Energy, the Mindanao Power Forum. That was for the first time um, created the venue uh, by which key stakeholders of uh, the power industry, consumer groups, local government officials all across um, provinces and uh, municipalities in Mindanao, um, electric cooperatives, private sector players have um, converged um, under one roof uh, to discuss once and for all the nagging issue of a supply shortfall and rotating brownouts from four hours to six hours, depending on your location, and in some areas up to 12 hours sometime around seven, six, eight years ago. And after the slating of the Mindanao Power Summit in 2012, a uh, few weeks later, Executive Order 81 was um, issued, creating the Mindanao Power Monitoring Committee to allow us here in Mindanao to take uh, the bulls by the horn, uh, so to speak, in terms of um, looking at and deciding and figuring out here in Mindanao the very specific way forward address our power situation. And all of those were um, definitely being pursued in collaboration with the members of the energy family led by the Department of Energy. And ensuing discussions uh, had been sustained um, through this time with the rest of the energy family members whose agency's role and mandate is crucial and integral to the overall efforts of addressing the long-term power requirements and addressing the immediate term of um, rotating thoughts in Mindanao during that time. And so the Mindanao Power Monitoring Committee became the venue for us to closely work with each other in partnership with uh, the private sector, uh, those in the distribution and generation, and including the Chambers of Commerce, to work collectively in terms of very specific measures to address uh, the situation. 
And since then, we have been able to put forward uh, many efforts uh, along this line and it had, in fact, been able to address the major concern of rotating brownouts. However, up until today, many of our areas still have these questions lingering in their mind because they are confronted with a sad reality that even with the excess supply we have in Mindanao today of over 1,000 megawatts, even at a record-breaking more than 2,000 megawatts demand already, as was cited by Yusek Mani Vanessa earlier, Many areas in Mindanao, up until today, still go through rotating brownouts to a certain extent. And what could be the reason uh, for this situation? And this is partly what would be discussed in today's Power Forum. We always have to embrace the fact and understand the context, especially those, our friends from Luzon and Ifesayas, that we are not special here in Mindanao. We are not spoiled, as some would like to point out, because we are enjoying cheaper sources of um, um, energy coming from our very own Agus Pulangi complex that is um, being um, uh, used, top, utilized, contracted by many of our marginalized areas and electric cooperatives here in Mindanao. And if you compare the situation in Mindanao and besides and so on, definitely there are peculiarities that look at the kind of situation that is distinct to our case and therefore the kind of policies that had to be put in place and the programs and projects that have to be carried out will have to understand those contexts here in Mindanao. An area which has the highest poverty incidence, area or region in the country that has gone through decades of armed conflict, areas of the country that has the lowest electrification rate at 70% Mindanao average versus more than 90% at national. And if we drill down to the Bang Samoro region, only having 30% rural electrification rate. And we go further, if we go further to island provinces of Basilan, Sulu, and Tawi-Tawi, the case is very much different compared to where we are and what we are and how we are faring here in Mindanao. So these are peculiarities, especially that Mindanao is consist of 38 electric cooperatives, 34 of them grid-connected, and the rest off-grid electric cooperatives. And therefore, the way we deal with the way forward in Mindanao has to take into account that particular reality. In Luzon, you have to speak to one entity alone, like Meralco, for instance. That's 70 percent already being handled by one entity. But in Mindanao, you have to go through electric cooperatives of varying financial capacities, of varying fiscal situation, of varying opportunities. Another very important reckoning in the case of Mindanao is to understand that we still have nearly 30 percent of our energy sources derived from Agus Pulagi complex under PISAM operated by Napocor, but still within government, yet to be privatized, or whether or not it's going to be privatized is another discussion uh, at some other forum. Another important um, factor to reckon with, although this is something that will have to be addressed in the next few months, uh, once NGCP will have completed the Visayas-Mindanao power interconnection, which will make Mindanao physically connected via submarine cable from um, uh, Dipolo all the way to um, Cebu, making Mindanao integrated to the Luzon and Visayas grids. But up to this point, these are very peculiarities that we have to take into account in terms of the very way forward we are addressing here in Mindanao. We also have to labor and to exert so much effort to make our consumers understand that power sector is being made up of several subsectors from the generation to transmission to distribution and eventually connection to their individual households, their homes or, their, or the commercial establishments. And all of this had to be taken into account, had to be understood because every subsector relates to the other and missing out on one sector will not provide us the complete picture in terms of pricing, in terms of whether or not we have brownouts as to whether or not the way forward is adequate and sufficient for Mindanao. A very important um, aspect that uh, needs to be understood, as was highlighted in the previous slide, is that Mindanao is served by electric cooperatives at, various, at varying capacities. And therefore, areas that are currently having the trouble of um, availability of electricity perhaps is on account of the electric cooperatives um, needing support, had to be assisted, 
and to be given focus in terms of way forward because those electric cooperatives and ECs definitely are going through a different landscape and realities compared to the all other electric cooperatives in Mindanao. Areas in Mindanao, especially the urban cities of Davao, Cagayan, Cotabato, and Indigan are also being served by private distribution uti utilities uh, that have a different personality in terms of its capacity to invest and to put forward services compared to the electric cooperatives. So all of this had to be understood in that context. And in Mindanao, as we have pointed out, electric cooperatives are of varying scales. Some are big, some are small, uh, depending on the number of consumers and according to their utilization of energy in their particular areas. Another context we have to understand in Mindanao um, as to the reason why we wanted to um, take a proactive stance and to be aggressive in terms of attracting and accelerating deployment of renewable energy in Mindanao because of the kind of energy mix we already have today. Uh, a mix that is already very much dominated by fuel sources that is imported. And when your fuel sources is imported, just like our vehicles, we are subject to market volatility, foreign exchange fluctuations, and tax. Therefore, if we compound all of this together, this reflects around 20% increase of our electricity rates from where we were six or seven years ago when Mindanao's grid was 70% renewable energy. But there are two sides of the coin, however, on this particular slide, because if we wanted also to increase the capacity factor of Mindanao's energy sources and ensure reliability of our grid, we definitely have to have the kind of mix that are able to complement each other. But definitely 15 years, 20 years down the road, as we look at addressing Mindanao's increasing demand, we have to be more aggressive this time around in attracting and injecting more and allowing renewable energy to kick in more power to the grid 15 years, 20 years down the road. Another major reckoning that we all have to understand is that the mainland Mindanao is better situated than our friends, brothers, and sisters in the island provinces, where perhaps 24 hours electricity would only be available in the capital, capital towns of Isabela City in Basilan, Polo in Sulu, or Bungao in Tawi-Tawi. But in the peripheries and the island municipalities of these island provinces, electricity probably ranges only around 12 hours. And there net, may not be even electricity at all at the southernmost tip of uh, the Philippines, which are part of the Bangsamoro, part of Mindanao, and part of the Philippines. The Therefore, provinces had to be given equity also to serve the kind of electricity services that we are enjoying in mainland Mindanao. And that is the Bangsamoro. We have to take into account that definitely this is a different situation and a different normal. And the impact of COVID to the power sector needs to be looked at in terms of what way our electric cooperatives would be able to address the current situation with closures of many industries, closures of hotels, reduction of operations of malls and many other industries, reduction or closure of tourism facilities and many other traditional load users of our electric cooperatives and DUs that have so far not been able to make a recovery. And this is something that really has affected many of our distribution utilities and our electric cooperatives. Another very important opportunity for us this time around, that's why we are putting forward the theme for today's Mindanao Power Forum, our pivot to renewable energy. And in earlier this month, in the speech of UN Secretary General Gutierrez, he had highlighted the very importance of us being able to address and deal with the challenges of climate change if we work together and take advantage of our recovery efforts post-pandemic by taking advantage and looking at renewable energy. And therefore, in Mindanao, where 8 out of 10 exportable commodities of the Philippines are coming from, where 40% of the country's food trade is derived from, where one-third of the farm area of all over the Philippines is um, account, accounting for, Mindanao needs to have an aggressive push towards powering our agri-producing areas with the value adding in the entire agriculture value chain complemented by energy value chain and renewable energy. Over this time, um, in light of the current situation that we are dealing, there have been several discussions already undertaken for uh, 
regional power forum that had been undertaken, the last uh, of which was the Sambuanga Peninsula Power Forum just a few weeks ago that had highlighted the need for collective action in terms of dealing with the outstanding and recurring power issues confronting the region, which is not unique, not distinct, because same issues are also being um, faced by many other electric cooperatives all across several other regions in Libya. And so um, through time and all these years, the continuing con convening and discussion of the Midina Power Monitoring Committee has created the venue for addressing some of those issues uh, as, have, as, as is being highlighted um, in the slide, where very specific discussions among MPMC members um, need to deal with um, looking at actions and way forward and responding to uh, outstanding concerns and issues raised by our energy consumers. And the need also to deal with our local government units. And that's why it has been a common consensus of the MPMC and the energy family that the way forward to any project, power project, in addressing power situation in Mindanao had to go through strong collaboration and partnership with the local government. Now, going back as to why um, we had to look at renewable energy as part of our theme moving forward, um, simply because the kind of energy mix that we have today, and therefore, we have to look at very specific policy push and implementation of specific activities, programs, and projects that will create a bandwagon of consensus and momentum towards attracting more RE to the Mindanao grid, and so that we can revert to our desired energy mix. Um, which we used to enjoy 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. But up until 2017, that is when we started to see the reversal of energy mix with fossil technology already dominating our energy mix in Mindanao. Again, as we have pointed out earlier, there are two sides of the coin in terms of this particular reality because of the need for us to also respond the economies of scale demand and the capacity factor that can be provided by fossil technology that is otherwise at this point the economy constrained, limited in terms of the ability of renewable technology. Up until such time between now and 15 years and 20 years when um, specific technologies that are superior in attributes compared to what we have now would be able to respond and um, address this particular energy mix. And based on um, the projections of the Department of Energy, and this is where we hope between now and 2025, for instance, government and private sector in Mindanao and even our investors based in the national capital, being able to understand the signals, when is the best time to invest in Mindanao? When is the best time to apply? And when is the best time to put forward power projects? Given that 2030, Mindanao is going to need 3,500 megawatts of capacity. And by 2040, 10,000 megawatts of capacity is projected to be needed in Mindanao. What we are looking at, hopefully, is that the kind of energy mix being injected into the Mindanao grid 10 years, 15 years down the road will be more of the renewable energy source. And this is where we are also uh, very much um, gearing up and in partnership with several development partners, and in this case, European Union and USAID, and, and many other um, activities with World Bank, ADB, JICA, and several other development partners working together, especially in terms of realizing a 100% electrification in Mindanao, and with special focus, especially in the off-grid areas. That will require different kinds of technologies and approaches in terms of electrification services. And therefore, um, we have to look at understanding the many challenges that continue to emerge um, out of the situation as we go by. So the, the situation we had five years, six years ago is definitely different from the situation we have today. But there are definitely new issues that will emerge and therefore will require a continuing collective action from all of us here in Mindanao among which is, of course, our continuing effort and advocacy to put forward very aggressive, proactive efforts to address electrification challenges in the island provinces 
of the Bangsamoro region. And electrification challenges also in the areas of Lanao do Sur and, um, and many other areas in the Bangsamoro region that up until today, even if they are in mainland Mindanao, are still not able to find a way and be in place with several other electric cooperatives in terms of the kind of their power situation. Also very important that we have this discussion this afternoon because DOE is set for each implementation in the next few days. The transition of Mindanao from a bilateral regime to a market-operated regime with the introduction of the wholesale electricity spot market in Mindanao. It's something that makes us prepared, ready for the eventual integration of Mindanao to the Luzon and Visayas grids once the Visayas-Mindanao Power Interconnection and NGCP shall have been completed. But even ahead of that particular reality, we'd like to look at whether or not Mindanao is ready to transition into a market-operated regime. And the need to also look at balance um, our energy sources, uh, given the increased share of fossil technology in our energy mix, with the introduction of renewable energy. And in all of this, having to make sure that every power plant that we have, transmission asset that we are putting in place, and our um, entire um, infrastructure in the energy sector would be able to withstand the challenges and the threats of climate change. In terms of rural electrification, this is our fighting target, um, considering that 16 of the top 20 um, ECs with least electrification all over the Philippines are in Mindanao. And that's why it behooves upon us, every single one of us today, attending the Mindanao Power Forum this morning, even if you are from Davao, from Cagayan, from General Santos, or wherever, uh, we have to look at not not ourselves as coming from our own city, but us, a, um, a, a Mindanaoan, having to um, look at what can we contribute to the other areas of Mindanao in terms of electrification. Another very important context that uh, we also have to embrace um, definitely are the realities of uh, the natural disasters that are now occurring at a more frequent interval. 20 years ago, uh, Mindanao prides itself as having or as an area of the Philippines that is typhoon free. But that is something that we can no longer claim since 10 years ago, especially when two of the most devastating typhoons that struck the Philippines in the last 10 years wrecked havoc in Mindanao. So we were no longer spared by uh, that particular reality. And therefore, we have to look at whether or not our own energy infrastructure are able to withstand these challenges. Also, the need to understand um, the very uh, impact of um, another very important reality of, of water changes that had been seen um, uh, transforming in Mindanao, where based on studies, 50 years from now, either Mindanao is going to be very, very wet or very, very dry. So those possible extremes, um, situation and reality, uh, definitely should signal us, should, should provide us the necessary context in terms of the kind of approaches we need to do in terms of understanding and embracing the water, energy, and food nexus strategies in Mindanao. And then embracing the current reality, something that um, has changed the way we deal with our every life, with really lives. Um, without COVID, we would probably be having a physical um, Mindanao Power Forum today. But because of this reality, uh, this is something that has uh, made us adjust to the realities of time. But this is not just a case, a situation, a news, an event. This is a reality. The current situation um, has affected us personally. Many of us lost our family members. Many of us lost friends. We lost a colleague at Minda and many other um, realities that um, is definitely um, painting a harsh situation. But we have to address, we have to adjust, and therefore, in terms of our way forward for the power sector, we have to look at how can we um, make the necessary um, uh, collaboration to be able to help many communities deal with the situation. 
especially on the economic aspect. Because of the government needing to save more lives, this is what happened. Uh, the downside and the flip side of such priority is the impact to our economy. But nonetheless, with um, the progress now we are seeing in terms of how national government is addressing this, many other industries started to look at doing reco economic recovery measures. We have uh, to also look at where the energy sector can concretely contribute. And that's why this forum today lays us down the context of building back a better Mindanao, taking into account and taking advantage of the opportunity we can put together in terms of ensuring that we are able to maintain, develop a resilient and sustainable energy sector. And so for session one um, this morning, we will be looking at how national government walks the talk in terms of very specific projects in partnership with European Union and USAID as among the very specific projects, looking at integrating, complementing, making it possible for agriculture and renewable energy to be viable so that this can be replicated in all other similarly situated areas. And this afternoon session, we looked at the broader context of the way forward in terms of building a secure and sustainable energy future for Mindanao. Also understanding the challenges being faced by our grid, transmission assets, and looking at how collectively we can pursue a smarter Mindanao grid. And the third very important topic this afternoon is looking at the situation of many of our electric cooperatives and distribution utilities and how else can we work collectively to be able to have um, everybody else moving at the same direction, at the same pace, and enjoying the same benefit in terms of the results of our action. And the last item is definitely tapping into what our financing institutions can contribute in terms of the many activities that are leading CAPEX and many projects that have to be pursued by private sector and needing proactive and contextualized financing um, um, set up to be able to move forward with those projects given the current situation. And all of this, hopefully at the end of the day, in today's Minden of Power Forum, will provide each and every one of us, the 460 that are now tuned in, logged in via Zoom, and the several hundred others that are watching us via Minda Facebook Live, to be able to have a complete picture and understanding of this is why we are having this event, because this is the Mindanao situation today. Thank you very much, Asikil, for giving a very comprehensive uh, background there and setting the context for what we are doing and why we are doing the things that we are doing today. Okay, uh, before you go, sir, uh, let us uh, uh, try to respond to this uh, uh, question that we have here in the chat box just so we can, you know, um, uh, deal, deal with this question. Uh, it's primarily concerned about the cost of electricity from the electric utilities, okay? Now, we understand that different locations, particularly different electric co-ops or distribution utilities have different costs as reflected on the consumer's electric costs. Now, we believe that this is primarily a function of the kind of power supply agreements that your DUs or your co-ops are getting into, okay? Now, different sources of energy like solar, hydro, oil, diesel, geothermal have different costs. Okay? Now, no single electric cooperative has a monopoly in a particular source of energy. Like, say, for example, 100% Agus Pulangi, uh, cheap hydropower electric energy. But the downside to that is no, um, why uh, electric cooperatives go into a, a mix of energy sources is that paano na lang may El Nino? Okay? They are going to be stuck with a power supply contract uh, that cannot uh, deliver full. Diba? Kasi mababa ang level ng tubig. So, you know, they, they have to do some bit of planning and adjustments and you know, some sort of a forward thinking in planning their power supply contracts. Okay? Now, that is the reason why we are aggressively pushing for renewable sources of energy, which are effectively cheaper in the long run. Because the more sources of renewable energy we have here in Mindanao generating cheaper electricity, the more we can have available to all the electric cooperatives and distribution utilities that they contract out and then supply to their 
um, consumers. Tama ba, Asik Yo? Yes, uh, Mox, uh, but I'd, I'd rather not preempt uh, the very essence of the discussions of many of our resource persons in the session this afternoon. But what is important to point out is that many of those are actually were highlighted in the speech earlier of uh, ERC Chair um, Agnes de Benadera. And uh, the very um, context that um, the kind of power rates we have in the Philippines is different from the rest of our neighbors. There are contexts to that. Um, unfortunately, it's not apples to apples comparison yeah. because our electricity rates reflect the true cost of technology compared to um, how prices are structured in our neighbors where around 40% of their rates are subsidized by their governments because they have their own fuel sources. They have uh, the coal, they have the gas, they probably have uh, the diesel that is needed compared to us that are 100% importing, for instance, this particular fuel requirements. And therefore, there are contexts to that, and I hope this is something that would be um, fairly and more adequately explained in the discussions this afternoon in the sessions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Asakil, for that clarification. Okay, moving forward, it's already um, 10.52, and we have a uh, couple more before we break for lunch. Now, next up, um, this is going to be very, very important now because uh, we're going to present to you, to the public, a, a, a project involving renewable energy and what we're doing for the island provinces in and around Mindanao. So to talk about the renewable energy technology for Tawi Tawi Seaweeds project, let us all welcome Mr. Willie Hick, uh, from the European Union delegation, the program manager for RETS, to give us information about this initiative. Good morning, everyone. Uh, while I was attending the presentation, I was so pleased to see so many known faces. And at the same time, uh, I couldn't help thinking that I miss so much those uh, presidential meetings. Uh, and uh, when we are sharing together opinions. And uh, uh, what I want to say is that the time has been passing, the times have been hard, but I, I'm very glad to see that the enthusiasm of you all still remains the same. And, uh, uh, and this would be my first comment. Uh, I, I'm, so, I'm so pleased to, to see that the commitments of everyone here. I, I was about to say around the table, but there is no table, but on the screen, on the screen still uh, remains the same. And, and that's very important that we have this event today that brings together all uh, key partners supporting Mindanao power sector, all partners committed to contribute to a sustainable and more resilient Mindanao. Ladies and gentlemen, Crazy crises such as the current pandemic are always critical moments affecting all sectors, but they are also an opportunity for reinventing oneself, to be more creative, to do more and better with a limited amount of resources. And this is particularly true for a strategic sector like power sector. I will be very short, Sagrid Langto. I would like to take the opportunity to reiterate the support of the European Union to the sector of renewable energy and further REDS grant, one of the seven grants awarded in their SEPRAM will be presented by the implementing partners and you will see how enthusiastic they are and how they, are, how they could cope with the complex current situation. This grant is really a good example of EU commitment in this sector. When the EU launched uh, the call for proposal uh, uh, in energy sector under ASEP program, we assigned 21 million euros for this program. The idea was to support the effort of the government of the Philippines to achieve the 100% electrification of households. And the, 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 the strategy of the call was to support actions contributing to improve the quality of life of marginalized rural communities group, while at the same time to mitigate the impact of climate change through assisting communities in rural areas to access renewable energy and employ energy efficient and disaster resilient technologies. REST program evidences successfully how 
a strong multi-sector stakeholder partnership involving regional authority, development partners, sector-specific entities, local authorities in academe can present a holistic approach for the electrification of Tawi Tawi, bringing innovative solutions that could be hopefully upscale and replicated in other areas of the region. I, I won't say much more about this program because it will be explained in, in much more detail afterwards. Let me once again thank you for organizing the event. Mara Ming Saramat Sain Yong Lahat at Ma Yong Puntak, and I uh, wish you all a very fruitful discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and the Council Lahat uh, Mr. Willie Hicks. To further our knowledge on the REST project, may we call on um, Hansen Stein, the Regional Director of UNIDO. Sir, Sir Hansen Stein. Secretary of Mindanao Development Authority, Department of Energy Secretary Kusi, Minister Makakua of Menre, the ERC Chairperson Devanatra, uh, Devanadera, distinguished participants, good morning. Last time I joined a, a forum with the Department of Energy was during the inception workshop in March for the preparatory phase of the e-mobility project, a collaboration between UNIDO and the Department of Energy. Today, is an equally wonderful opportunity to once again join the DOE to officially launch the construction phase of the EU-funded renewable energy technology to increase value added of seaweeds in Tawi Tawi, or in short, REDS. As part of UNIDO's trust to ensure that the benefits of prosperity are shared by all and that no one is left behind, in reaping the benefits of growth and progress, an intervention to support a locality like Tawi Tawi should be well in the portfolio of activities in the Philippines. UNIDO and MINDA having agreed to cooperate towards the pursuit of sustainable development goals of Mindanao found Tawi Tawi as an ideal place to start. One of MINDA's priority projects has been to position Tawi Tawi as a competitive economic player in local as well as international markets. The province lies in the area being developed as the Bangsamoro Economic Corridor, an area instrumental in the further development of the Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, East Asian growth area subregion. The Mindanao Development Authority is also develop, developing the seaweed industry in Tawi Tawi to regain its place as a major marine culture hub of the country. As such, the EU-funded REDS project would serve as a catalyst in terms of increasing economic opportunities through increased access to and availability of electricity in off-grid islands like Sitangai and Sibutu in the province of Tawi Tawi, which are home to seaweed farmers. The project is unique. It, it is founded on a partnership among development partners, academia, electric cooperative, local government, and the private sector. In particular, the solar diesel hybrid energy systems that we are launching today is 70% funded by the European Union with co-funding from both the government and the private sector. That is, the provincial government of Tawi Tawi and the Association of Isolated Electric Cooperatives Incorporated Island Light and Water Energy Development Corporation. On behalf of UNIDO, I would like to congratulate our partners, the Mindanao Development Authority, Tawi Tawi Electric Cooperative, 
MSU Tawi Tawi College of Technology and Oceanography, and the provincial local government of Tawi Tawi, the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries and Agrarian Reform, and private sector, IAIC, ILAO, for the realization of the REDS project. I thank you. Thank you very much uh, from the regional director, the regional director of UNIDO, Mr. Hansen Stein. Okay. At this point, uh, to, give, to give us actual on the ground updates on the REDS project, um, let us all welcome Ms. Pamela Seya Burlaza of the REDS Project Management Union. Ms. Pam? Hi, um, Raymond, good morning. Let give me a few seconds to share my screen. No? Okay. Um, my audio is okay, no? Raymond, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you Thanks. clearly. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, we wish to thank, of course, Minda for giving us this opportunity of um, flexing <laughs> the project rates to 400 plus people in this um, in the uh, in this forum this morning. So Stein and Willie have given the background for the project. So let me just get to the um, what's happening on the ground. So REDS is renewable energy technology to increase value added of seaweeds in Tawi-Tawi. We have, of course, this is EU funded through a project, um, ASEP, which is um, also a partnership between EU and the Department of Energy. We have several stakeholders in the project. We have UNIDO and MINDA, of course, MSUTCPO, Tawelco. The provincial local government of Tawi Tawi, we have Ayak Ilao, the private sector partner, and Bar Mafar. REDS is at the southernmost tip of the Philippines, and our project is located farther down south, also at the south tip of Tawi Tawi. We are in Sitangkai and Sibutu. We are currently building a total of 1.65 um, megawatts of um, solar installation on these islands. 650 kilowatts in Sibutu and one megawatt in Sitangkai. Um, the project is um, funded by the European Union, 3 million euros, and the balance of the 4.3 million will be funded by both government and the private sector. Because the project is one with the Department of Energy's um, thrust on electrification, total electrification, we will be connecting to this reliable, and not only reliable, but renewable um, energy source, about 3,500 households. And a five kilometer reliable distribution line will also be constructed also by, this will also be funded by another EU um, program. And this will be operated later by Tawelco, which is also our partner. As, um, Chairman Devanadera mentioned earlier, we should take care of our health. We should also look at the, the situation, uh, current situation. And ASECU also mentioned the pandemic and its effect. And so I, I think that it is very timely that um, we have included, that the REPS project includes also a study for adequate access to clean water in these two islands. Water is very um, limited, especially in Sitangkai. Sibutu has a source, but what they do is they transport their water, they somehow export their water to Sitangkai. So water source is um, very critical. And we think that with the pandemic, you know, this is a, uh, it's high time that we also look at this um, water source for Sitangkai and Sibutu. Because the S in RETS is also, is actually for seaweeds. Our, the main beneficiary, the end beneficiary of REDS are the seaweeds farmers. We have, um, along with the electrification program, we also have um, pro um, pro a program, a component that would be benefiting 
the seaweeds farmers. So in particular, I would like to show you what we have done so far, which is the dryer, the solar assisted seaweeds dryer. Let me show you what we have done in the last, um, we started with this in November. And when we visited the project in March, this is what they have. Um, sorry, I was informed walang sound yung video, but um, can I go? Uh, hi, Pam, still no sound. Oh. Anyway, um, there's no sound. Uh, when you click on share screen, try to uh, make sure you check that tick box about uh, sharing audio. Uh -huh. But anyway, it's just some music actually. So okay. maybe we can just <laughs> go Voice through the video found. without the sound. <laughs> Beat, um, sound lang naman is some music. So this is currently at the MSUT CTO campus. Okay. Now the governor, uh, Mang Sali, cannot join us today because he's like going around the islands at this time, also related to the COVID-19 situation in Tawi-Tawi. But um, we asked for a message you know, from the governor and here he is some um, he wishes to thank everyone all the efforts um, exerted on this project because the governor and his team thinks that the reds is bringing innovation to tawi tawi and that the province of tawi tawi is grateful to everyone in the reds project for including the islands of sitangka and sibutu um, in the reds project and it reflects the vision of bringing tawi tawi to the world that's some um, Governor Mangsan. And I wish to introduce also the UNIDA Program Manager for RETS, Ms. Katarina Baruniga. She will be um, giving us um, a background on what has been happening in the last few months on the project. I hope this has a, bit, uh, a sound. No? Oh. There's no sound. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, pa stop na lang yung sharing and then reshare again and then make sure you ano. Uh, yeah. Sorry, um, Raymond. Um, just stop the sharing muna and then reshare uh -huh. it and then make sure yung ano uh, optimize for sound naka check yung ano tick box. Okay, let me do it again. And then, okay, uh, diretso ka na sa, just go to the video, to the slide video na. It's not here. Okay. Okay, I, I hope I shared the sound this time. So let me go back to um, 
let me go back to the slide where Katarina was supposed to speak. Sorry. Sorry for this technical <laughs> difficulty. At least we have sound now, Pam. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so again, this is Katarina Veronica um, from UNIDO. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UNIDO, as the lead applicant and the implementer of renewable energy technology to increase value-added CVs in Tawi Tawi, or what we call REDS project, allow me to use this opportunity and thank the European Union for bringing this project to Tawi Tawi. Innovation is in core of its mandate. Therefore, UNIDO is very pleased to be working on this project in the Philippines. The project activities have experienced challenges due to pandemic as all the other projects have. However, with the full support of our partners, we were able to achieve many activities. Government Magsai and his team have fully supported project from securing the project site to co-financing the construction of activities. We have experienced challenges during the implementation of equipment. However, with the support of Minda and IEC, we were able to overcome this. We have reliable EPC contractor, Orlai, who was able to deliver all the equipment in February 2021. Our private sector partner, Isaac Elau, is also co-financing the construction and overseeing the design. Being one of the EU ASA projects, we were pleased to experience full support from DOE and its family, MPC and NEA. Allow me to conclude and once again thank all the partners for their continuous support and let me reiterate that UNIDO is pleased to deliver solar hybrid power project to Tawi Tawi. for listening to our presentation, and good morning. Thank you very much, Pam, for that wonderful presentation on the updates regarding what we're doing there with the use of renewable energy to increase productivity in Tawi Tawi, which is practically at the farthest borders of, not just of Mindanao, but in the all of the Philippines, and we really, really appreciate what you're doing over there, what we are all doing over there, okay? Thank you very much, Pam. Okay, uh, before we proceed, I would like to uh, thank everyone for having a, uh, a very lively uh, discussion here at the chat box for our uh, Zoom. Okay, um, we are noting all your concerns uh, for proper responses later. Okay, we're going to take exceptions on this. This is not the time to raise your questions and expect an answer at this time. Okay, we have a program, we're going to follow the program. But this afternoon, we will have panel discussions for the whole industry sector, starting from regulation, generation, distribution, and transmission, okay? And we have the proper speakers to respond to your questions then. Thank you very much for your cooperation. Just continue typing in your questions. We're taking note of them. Thank you very much. Now we shall proceed to the um, European Union.
EU Access to Sustainable Energy Program, or EU ASEP, specifically on the integration of productive uses of renewable energy for sustainable and inclusive energization in Mindanao, or what we call the iPure Mindanao Project. So to formally launch the EU ASEP iPure Project, may we call Ms. Eliana Miritescu, the EU Program Manager, to provide us a, a short introduction about this project. Uh, thank you. Uh, very much. Uh, Honorary Secretary Emmanuel Niol of Minda, Honorary Secretary Alfonso Cusi of Department of Energy, Honorary Makakwa of Menre, and Honorary Chairperson Agnes Devanadera of ERC, distinguished participants, warm greetings and a very good morning to you all. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to be with you today on the occasion of the official launching ceremony of the integration of productive use of renewable energy for sustainable and inclusive energization in Mindanao, or iPure project. The EU recognizes the growing momentum towards a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery after the COVID pandemic, focusing on clean energy and low carbon scenarios. It is in this context that in April 2021, the EU has awarded the IPUR grant to NEA in partnership with MINDA worth 5 million euros in support of the Philippine Energy Plan and the Mindanao's trust of recover, focusing on sectors that will bring about greater impact. The project we're launching today, together with NEA, MINDA, electric cooperatives and LGUs, will help accelerate Mindanao's people's access to clean energy. It will provide electricity through the provision of 3,077 solar home systems and demonstrate it is a viable least cost electrification option for off-grid and widely dispersed households. It will also support line extension electrification additional 2,148 households. And this access to energy is vital. It will increase the quality of life in rural areas improve health and educational services, and bring clear benefits, including to women and children. Last but not least, the project will increase the production and income of farmers and employment generation through the introduction of pure pilots in agri-fishery value chain. Today's project launch will help set the stage for the project implementation. And there we hope that this project will serve as a platform to scale up models to promote access to renewable energy solutions in far-flung areas. For the project to be a success, we believe that all partners and stakeholders need to collaborate and coordinate closely. And this includes local government units, electric cooperatives, community residents, community-based organizations, women groups, and academic communities. Finally, we hope the project will bring a real positive change for the many unserved and underserved communities in Mindanao, which will translate in better living conditions and increase resilience for many in Mindanao. I wish a fruitful and lively discussion to everyone today and the successful project implementation. Thank you and welcome again. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Ms. Eliana Miritescu, the program manager from the European Union. Okay. Now, to talk more about, uh, to give us, to give everyone a, a, a short project brief on the iPure Mindanao project and representing the administrator of the National Electrification Administration, Mr. Eduardo Masongsong, we have, let us all welcome, Mr. Ernesto O. Silvano Jr., the department manager of the from the Total Electrification and Renewable Energy Development Department. Sir Silvano, po, you are now live. Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning, Raymond. Thank you for the introduction. And to Ms. Eliana also. Uh, we're grateful for the EU and for Minda for having us here. And I am uh, presenting in behalf of the administrator since uh, he uh, simultaneously is hosting a CMC seminar with the Luzon ECs, but he'll be joining shortly after he finishes. Let me share the screen. I think I just have a five minute uh, project brief for this. Uh,
I'm trying to <laughs> oh it's here okay Wait. is it already there Raymond you're seeing it yes sir I can see your PowerPoint presentation okay thank you uh, this is just a brief one and we call the latest of the projects uh, being supported by EU as iPure Mindanao being launched uh, for today. Actually, we had our steering committee meeting. This was also launched yeah, last week. So the title is Integration of Productive Uses of Renewable Energy for the Inclusive and Sustainable Energy Station in Mindanao. Uh, let me do the project brief. As, uh, in April 2020 of last year, uh, this was uh, initiated uh, by the Department of Finance, signing with EU the so-called ASEP financing agreement, earmarking an additional 6 million euros, of which 4.5 billion euros could be tapped to fund livelihood and electric electrification projects using renewable energy solutions in the marginalized and disadvantaged communities in Mindanao. So in August 2020, as we started collaborating with, of course, as endorsed by EU and DOE, we started collaborating with MINDA here uh, to bring about what sustainable rural development program would be good for Mindanao. And then after a year of uh, collaboration, so this, this was a one year in the making. In April 16, 2021, the integration of productive uses of renewable energy for sustainable inclusive energization in Mindanao, or shortly IPR Mindanao, uh, was officially or officially was born and began with an approved budget from the European Union amounting to uh, about 4.5 million euros and uh, about 247.5 million in pesos. Under three components, and uh, uh, with a 20 months of project implementation, which is until December 15. So we've barely been just a month from the approval. So here is how it goes. For component one, it's titled the uh, productive uses of uh, renewable energy. And uh, it will implement or support uh, 10, project sites in Mindanao, in uh, North Cotabato, South Cotabato, Sultan Kudarat, and one in Tawi-Tawi, four corn, all solar powered, of about four corn shellers, corn miller and shellers, then of course the seaweed dryer in Tawi-Tawi, then uh, solar powered uh, rice miller and ice making facility, and a coffee dryer and miller into these different franchise areas uh, uh, benefited. Uh, Cotelco, Socoteco 2, so, uh, Lasoreco, and of course, Tawi Tawi. So the total cost would be about 80.69 uh, million in pesos this time. That's for component one, a productive use of renewable energy, 10 sites in Mindanao. So this at the right side is an example, as has already been mentioned earlier, the, the, the uh, Abaca, uh, Abaca stripper machine, also solar powered in Malita, which serves as one of the pilots. So for component two, we just simply call it household electrification and it involves Two project sites for PVM, PV mainstreaming or solar home systems, and one in Tawelco, uh, Barangay Line Extension Project to support this, the seaweed factory in Sitangkay and Cebuto to boost its power requirement as it starts to expand uh, later on. So along the line, there will be 2,084 households, about that much, that would benefit from electrification as well. Uh, for Cotelco, uh, PV mainstreaming, we are seeing a 1,500 household will benefit from the solar home system. 
and for Socoteco 2, 1577 households will benefit. All of these three projects will be about 110.78 million pesos. And briefly again, for the third component is a project management and cross-cutting activity, which will support the first two components. Uh, it's nothing different from actually uh, doing the, the capacity building, the uh, trainings of all those who will be involved in the, the component one and two, and including investment forums, including all the administrative and trainings. And uh, so it uh, amounts to about uh, for two years would be about 18.9 million in all of the activities. So uh, let me end uh, shortly <laughs> with just a, a word uh, through these initiatives and with the uh, cumulative efforts from uh, all stakeholders. We believe that we can create a brighter tomorrow for the future generation of this country, despite the present global crisis. To note that we, we are still a month old from the approval. So maybe in the next forum, we'll have more to present to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Paul, for that wonderful presentation, Mr. Silvano. No? Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an example of the, what we can do in the far-flung areas to increase productivity through the use of renewable energies okay, from the government side. And hopefully, hopefully the private sector will also see the benefits of investing in renewable energies to increase productivity in our rural areas who have been neglected for the longest time. Okay? Now, every project needs the support of the stakeholders to ensure the attainment of the objectives. This is similar to the EU asset hybrid project, which needs support of the local government units. And with this, may we ask Mayor Vivian Yap of Glan in the province of Sarangani to give a message of support and commitment to this project. Good noon, actually, to the Honorable Secretary Pinol, Emmanuel Pinol, to Secretary Alfonso Pusi, to uh, the Chairperson of BRC, Agnes de Vanadera, uh, Minister Maka Makakua, and the rest of our EU visitors, guests, to everybody, good noon. Uh, I come from a very remote town in the Philippines, part of Sarangani province, and a lot of our places, especially in the Jida area, have no electricity. We are blessed. We are deeply grateful of the projects of our friends so that these people of ours, who are most of them all are IPs, who never had tested and have seen a light in their life, would soon experience seeing a light, and their children can now study at night they don't have to eat early in the afternoon because there's no light at night. And it would, I know, would greatly help my municipality, as being the tourism capital of Sarangani. Uh, it would boast also the economy, and it would uh, entice investors to come and invest in my municipality. This program of ours is very much needed and has long been awaited for. Thank you, Secretary Pinol for looking at us, our place, our great dear Mindanao. We have to improve, as we were known before, as the food basket of the country. We have to cope up with times, and this is what we need. We are all being supplied by Sokoteco too. Though Sokoteco too has been affected by the advent of this pandemic of ours, but then I know they have been trying to do their best for their line extensions to areas which have some roads. Unpassable. So, uh, for and in behalf of the whole people of my municipality and the whole of Sarangani province, we will and surely assure everybody that we will be supporting this endeavor because we know we need this and this is what we long for. It would come out as a dream soon to be fulfilled by the people of Sarangani. Thank you very much for the help. And we will continue on working together for the sake of our people, especially those who belong 
to the poverty threshold, that we will lift them up. We will do selfless help to the people for the greater glory of God. Thank you very much. I, Dr. Vivian Yap, would assure you a thousand percent of my support. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. To God be the glory. Thank you very much and maraming maraming salamat po for your commitment uh, to this project po, uh, Mayor Vivian Yap of Glen, Sarangani. Now, next, uh, let us welcome a message of commitment and support from one of our partner electric cooperatives. May we call the general manager, Godofredo Gomez of Cotelco, to give his message for this project. Good, good. My courtesy to the Department of Energy, uh, um, represented by Emmanuel Juanesa, Under Secretary. The Mindanao Development Authority, Menda Secretary Manny Pinol. Energy Regulatory Commission Chairperson Agnes de Vanadera. Our Administrator Edgardo Rama Masongsong, delegates, guests in this 2021 Mindanao Power Forum. Good morning. The Cotabato Electric Cooperative Cotelco, who provides electric distribution services to the 11 municipalities in one city of the province of North Catabato is so thankful for being one of the recipient and beneficiary of the Window One Photovoltaic Mainstreaming Program of DOE, NEA, through the Access for Sustainability Energy Program, or ASEP. It was on February of 2016 when the Photovoltaic Mainstreaming PBM was introduced to Cotelco giving hope to an electrified household that are situated three kilometers or more away from our existing conventional line or grid. This off-grid uh, electrification program is initiated by NEA, the Department of Energy, in relation to its Access Sustainability Energy Program, or ASEP, which subsidy fund is provided by the European Union, EU, as donor in the World Bank as trustee. The project objective is to contribute to the goal of the national government to achieve 90% household electrification in 2018, considering Cotelco's electrification level is below 90%. Cotelco, together with other three electric cooperatives in the nearby regions, Dabao del Sur Electric Cooperative, Dasureco, South Cotabato Electric Cooperative, Du, and Sultan to the RAT Electric Cooperative Sokelco are the beneficiaries of this window one TBM asset, all having a very low percentage of energized household on far flung areas with solar home systems through PV mainstreaming is the answer to the lifelong dream of having access to electricity. On the second quarter of 2018, Cotelco received 2,500 units composed of system controller, cell phone charger and radio, solar panels, LED bulbs for each unit. This comprises one set of solar home system, HES. The area beneficiaries are being determined through the remote sensing facility provided of, or provider of which the municipalities of Magpet, Arakan, President Rojas and Makilala are the first priority with several identified households far away from the grid. Before the year 2018 ends, the 2,500 units were all installed after contracting private installers and verificators to ensure that each unit are installed according to the specification of the Department of Energy. Energy Regulatory Commission or ERC approved the tarifa for the loading system through bending station of a maximum monthly rate of 220 pesos. A user's card will be provided to its beneficiary, which will be loaded in a bending agent identified by the electric cooperative. This amount will shoulder the cost of the staff and technician maintaining the efficiency of its unit and also provide the materials and services for the continuity of the operation of the solar home system in our respective area of concern. Further, to ensure effective and efficient implementation of the whole solar home system, 
a solar business unit was established. This dedicated unit is responsible to oversee and monitor the overall activities of PBM, business to include technical, marketing, institutional, and financial. On the other hand, there were also issues and concerns being encountered along the way, especially during the onslaught of COVID-19 pandemic. These issues include unstable peace and order in some PBM source area, which hampered the implementation of the project and the reduced collection efficiency brought about by the financial crippled beneficiaries. The earthquake also caused hundreds of families to the homeless to be, or to be homeless, including our PBM program beneficiaries, which deliberately affected our 2019 operations. Generally, this program of the national government helps uplift the lives of our recipient household and the satisfaction of having lights, radio, and a charger with a provision for a small television in a far-flung areas, not imagining that such kind of program reaches their areas. And what is more impressive is we treated them equally members with the on-grid connection. And for 2020, we are happy to note our level of energization increased to 92%. In a few months now, we are waiting for the PBM ASEP 22, of which, again, your electric cooperative is a recipient. There are 5,000 units allotted that will benefit the areas of municipality of Carmen, Cabacan, and Matalam as our priorities. Finally, our gratitude to the Department of Energy, National Electrification, and European Union, and World Bank for this technology that help us electrify households, rarely given the opportunity to avail rural electrification to PB mainstreaming. Thank you so much, and good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, Paul, for your message of support and commitment. Uh, GM, Paul Mesco, Hotelco. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning. Okay, um, next up, we're going to talk about, based on our program, which we have sent out to all the registered participants of this forum, okay? And uh, the last part of our program for this morning, before we proceed to the technical discussions on the industry, the power industry this afternoon is uh, about USAID's Energy Secure Philippines or Mindanao project. Okay. Um, in this regard, uh, to give an overview of this uh, project that we're working on together with USAID, let us welcome uh, to the virtual floor the chief of the USAID Environment Office, Mr. John Edgar, to give us an overview of the Energy Secure Philippines Mindanao project. Uh, thank you so much, Raymond, and thanks uh, for Minda in organizing this important uh, power forum. Uh, I'd also like to provide greetings to the numerous uh, attendees. I, I think it's more than 450, so it shows a very strong interest uh, for these issues. Uh, special acknowledgments to Secretary Emmanuel Pinal of the Mindanao Development Authority, Secretary Alfonso Cusi. Uh, of the Department of Energy, uh, member of the Bang Samora Parliament and Minister of Environment, Natural Resources to Energy, uh, Honorable uh, Adurof A. Makakua, uh, Chairperson of ERC, Agnes de Vendera, uh, Administrator Eduardo Masangong of the Natural, uh, National Electrification Administration, uh, Mayor Vivian Yap uh, of Glan Sarangani, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a pleasant day to all, and thanks again for the invitation. Uh, we're privileged to join you today to discuss uh, the lingering and emerging challenges to the energy sector and how we can work together to achieve energy security and sustainability goals in the Mindanao region, but also nationwide. I represent the United States Agency for International Development, which is the lead U.S. government agency on development and humanitarian assistance to save lives, reduce poverty, strengthen democratic governance, and promote a path for countries' resilience as well as self-reliance. The Philippines is one of uh, the, the ASEAN region's leaders in taking uh, steps forward in progress for power sector privatization and energy innovation. Policy reforms over the previous decades have opened new opportunities to mainstream emerging technology development from harnessing geothermal energy to solar power and a variety of renewable energy options that utilize 
the Philippines' rich natural resources. Of course, immense uh, these developments in the energy sector, we've also seen the catastrophic, catastrophic events such as typhoons that have inflicted heavy damage on people, local economies, and of course, the energy infrastructure. Over the last 15 months globally, the COVID-19 pandemic has altered the patterns of energy consumption, affected utility operations in various ways, and caused significant delays in the realization of the much needed investments and uh, upgrading in the energy sector. On the flip side, the pandemic underscores the critical role in energy in supporting the use of new tools, such as digital platforms for various applications in the delivery of health and social services, as well as the need for flexibility given the rapidly changing energy sector itself. In all the unprecedented challenges we face, the partnership between the US government and the government of the Philippines remains strong. The U.S. government, through USAID, is committed to support the progressive uh, developments of the country's power sector through several ongoing technical assistance efforts. Uh, this last year, USAID has supported MINDA with the analysis of COVID-19 impacts on select utilities in Mindanao, as well as the power sector within the region. Looking forward, we also have exciting news regarding USAID's new energy activity, the Energy Secure Philippines uh, Project. Energy Secure Philippines was awarded in November 2020 and is USAID's five-year flagship energy project that aims to advance the country's self-reliance by helping build a more secure and resilient Philippines energy sector. The project is in line with U.S. government strategies such as the Asia Enhancing Development and Growth Through Energy, or Asia Edge, which is a whole-of-government effort to grow sustainable and secure energy markets through uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Asia Ed seeks to strengthen energy security through energy diversification and trade and expanded energy access uh, across the region. I would also like to import a highlight uh, that President Biden's administration has put climate change at the center of US foreign policy and national security. Through Energy Secure Philippines, we will further our co cooperation on clean energy opportunities to advance the Philippines commitments through the recently updated nationally determined contribution plan supporting the Philippines climate ambition goals. While Energy Secure Philippines supports national energy priorities, we recognize uh, the unique conditions in each of the major regions of the country and the linkages to national goals. Thus, we're dedicating resources to enable Energy Secure Philippines to work in select sites in Luzon, Visayas, and of course, Mindanao. For instance, the benefits of a unified power system, which would be realized through the interconnection of Mindanao with the Luzon and Visayas grids, underscores the importance of an enhancing energy security and reliability, as well as instituting measures to strengthen cybersecurity across the grid. We will work with national and local governments, private sector, and non-governmental organizations on these and other concerns. Energy Secure Philippines builds upon USAID's uh, long and successful partnership with MINDA in advancing low emission strategies and renewable energy through uh, the One-Stop Facilitation and Monitoring Center, which was a precursor to the Department of Energy's Energy Virtual One Shared System or Energy Virtual One-Stop Shop. It goes without saying, but the Energy Secure Philippines objectives aligns uh, priorities of the Philippines Energy Plan that was developed with significant input from representatives of the Philippine government, uh, private sector, and non-state actors. USAID will broaden participation in the energy sector through its upcoming Energy Evolution Challenge, which is a grant mechanism that will provide the impetus for innovative and scalable ideas, initiatives, projects, enterprises, and technologies that will help build the country's energy security and reliance. Uh, once again, thank you for this opportunity to introduce Energy Secure Philippines. I look forward to participating in the technical discussions, and we're also very lucky uh, to have the Energy Secure Philippines Chief of Party, um, Ms. Ching Kwong Ko, who's going to provide uh, more details regarding uh, the activity and potential collaborations uh, in the Mindanao region. Uh, thank you again, and congratulations uh, in organizing this forum. Thank you very much, Mr. John Edgar, the Chief of the USAID's Environment Office. Thank you very much. Um, up next, uh, to walk us through 
um, the Energy Secure Philippines program and how it would aid Mindanao's power sector to achieve a regime of sustainable, reliable, and affordable power. Let us all welcome the Energy Secure Philippines Chief of Party, Ms. Divina Chinquango, to present to us the ESP project ring. Ms. Bang? Hi, good morning. Uh, joining me for this presentation is our communications manager, Pia Salvanera. So, P, um, I'm going to introduce ESP. It's, uh, it aims to enhance energy security and reliability, particularly now that we are looking forward to a unified power system. We aim to do this uh, by contributing 500 megawatts of additional generation capacity, capacity and fully supported by the private sector to roughly $750 million. The SP has a grants under contract mechanism, uh, and as John Edgar said, it's, it aims to support various tasks and interventions designed to effectively implement USADSP's activity. It is categorized into two. The first one is supporting policy and technical studies and researches meaning the aim is to, to establish a very independent think tank that the government can use for policy studies and the outputs can be used as inputs to decision process. And the second one is to introduce new concept or pilot new technology or scale up concepts that have been proven, which would be innovative and bringing out uh, New renewable energy systems that would address the power system or the power, power sector problems across the country. ESP has three objectives. The first one is to improve electric utility performance. Objective two increases the deployment of advanced energy sources and systems. And the third one is the last phase of the power sector reform process enhancing competition competition in the power sector and hopefully bringing competition into the household levels. ESP is a five-year project. We were born in November 2020 and project will end in November 18, 2025. The project has a national geographic focus and it would focus on three special economic zones. Clark Clark of free economic zones, Subic, and hopefully Cavite Eco Zone run by PESA. We also have pilot cities that are largely influenced by USAID Cities Development Initiative. We're working in Batangas City now, Tagbilaran City, and General Santos City, but that does not mean that we are precluded from working with other. Uh, sections or areas in the country as we move along towards our terminal life. Next, Pia. So our government partners or key government partners are the Department of Energy and the Energy Regulatory Commission. In Mindanao, what we do not do anything in Mindanao without collaborating or closely coordinating with the Mindanao Development Authority. So the next slide basically gives you the consortium that supports CSP activity. I am from RTI International, and we're so proud to have four local subcontractors to support us for this activity. We have Wise Energy, Full Advantage Philippines, Penwood Corporation, Planroar, the Philippine League of Local Environment and Natural Resources Incorporated, and we bring in new concepts or new technologies from our US-based partners, Chessie and her next and Vital LLC. So next few slides basically summarize what we have in store for year one. We're working with Sokoteco 2, Bohol Light uh, Company, Subic and her zone in developing utility improvement and reliability plan. Uh, uh, supporting activity for this would be the performance assessment um, and the benchmarking study of electric utility performance. We are looking forward to 
hearing the initial studies of the USAID RDM, RDMA on the, COVID, on the impact of COVID-19 on power utilities and hoping to build on that and replicate that study and then develop financial recovery plans for selected electric power utilities. We are assisting the Energy Regulatory Commission in resolving cases under the rules for setting electric cooperatives or wheeling rates or the RSEC WR, which would impact a lot of the electric cooperatives across the country. We are working with DOE on doing the assessment of resilience compliance plans. And hopefully the third, the third item in this slide would be the development of reliability and resilience scorecard. For the rest of objective one, uh, we are looking at developing a smart buyer toolkit that guides uh, distribution utilities on how to do competitive selection process. Uh, cybersecurity is, important, is an important feature or an important segment for this USA ESP activity. So we hope to be able to develop an assessment framework and customized standards so that we would be able to address any cyber threat that will be facing uh, in the future. If you follow the US, the US news on cybersecurity, the colonial pipeline was just recently ransomed by uh, hackers. Objective two is supporting the implementation of the Energy Efficiency Conservation Act. We're working with LGUs on the uh, and DOE on the development of a data energy portal that tracks uh, energy usage of highly energy intensive industries. Uh, we're also looking at developing the local energy code and the supporting local energy uh, efficiency and conservation plans. On the other side of the screen, you can see uh, that we're also going to develop local energy plans for selected LGUs. That basically summarizes everything that the LGUs would be doing with respect to the EEC and the local energy code. Uh, we hope to be able to partner with DOE and uh, probably some ESCOs in uh, conducting local energy audits. And recently we've been talking with DOE on supporting e vehicles. We focus on charging stations. Next slide, please. As you probably know by now, EVOS has been, the EVOS Act was passed and we're supporting DOE in the full implementation of EVOS with respect to the integration of relevant PUs and relevant LGUs to the EVOS platform as pilots. Next slide, please. Um, we are supporting several development regulatory frameworks for ERC, one of which is the natural gas, uh, distributed energy resources, energy uh, storage systems, the cost recovery of compliance to RPS, and the aggregation rules. We will probably be working with a lot of you on those regulatory frameworks. We are also supporting private sector engagement, of course, as we aim to be able to contribute 500 megawatts funded yearly by the private sector. We are supporting uh, several uh, private sector across the country on renewable energy, and we would be consulting DOE and ERC on this. We will be sitting down with the Mindanao Development Authority on the update of the Mindanao Energy Plan. And of course, we look forward to working with AMRECO on this. We are building on the output of the water energy food nexus study and hopefully use that study as a platform in order to determine the hydro power expansion in Mindanao, considering that hydro supposedly is relatively cheaper. And as part of our activity, we hope to be able to develop innovative financing, introduce targeted financing products so that we would be able to support even small grids or small and medium enterprises moving forward. 
So objective three is basically the focus of our ESP activity for the last few months, as we're supporting the or supported the Department of Energy in the development of the Green Energy Auction Program. So after us of the day, we supported the Green Energy Auction Design Document, also developed the terms of reference, helped develop the renewable energy IT platform so that it would be an online auction. And as part of the supporting uh, activity in, in the platform and the green energy auction, we also develop load profiling for distribution utilities and or mandated participants. And hopefully we would be able to support Green Energy Implementation Agreement of ERC and finalize this and within the year be able to be part of the Green Energy Auction launch, launch led by TOE. We look forward also to helping support the full implementation of the Green Energy Auction Program. We're so pleased to hear from Chairman Agnes, Chairwoman Agnes, that the ERC passed or issued the regulatory framework for GEOP. And as I said a while ago, we are in the process of developing the aggregation rules and we'll be sitting down with Director Sharon of the ERC on this. Part of this would be scenario building on what constitutes contiguous or how do we define contiguity and how it will impact you know, uh, households or end users. So next slide would be uh, the, the rest of objective three would be developing RES scorecard so that uh, it, it empowers consumers on which would be the best RES to work with. And as trying to upgrade the standards for equipment and services, we are also developing a compendium of suppliers for these equipment and services. And we will be touching base with a lot of you on this. And the last uh, item on this slide would be the development of the standards of quality for equipment and services as we finalize the compendium and the consultations on this. We have cross-cutting activities, meaning this would be the information, education, and communication, as well as public consultations or public hearings. So recently we participated with MINDAS, our partner, during the Energy Efficiency Conservation Act Forum just a week ago. And we are going to conduct IEC activities to promote EECA uh, together with DOE and relevant government agencies. We will support capacity building sessions across the country or across sectors with our government partners, even the private sector. And the last would be, we intend to hold a women-led conference before the year is over. So my last slide basically focuses on our uh, collaboration with Minda. Uh, Sophia, please. Uh, so this would be the development of business models for market-based transformation. And then the second item would be the technical studies and reviews, review of, as I said, the Mindanao Energy Plan to account for the impact of COVID-19 to the energy sector. We will be supporting selected LGUs in energy audits and the development of energy management plans for selected industries or distribution utilities. And um, the, the foundation of all USAID would be capacity building and awareness in order to ensure that there would be sustainability as the program ends. So thank you very much. I think that is my last slide. Thank, thank you very you. much, Buck. Uh, Ms. Divina Chingpuanco, the uh, Chief of Party of Energy Secure Philippines Project. Uh, Mind has worked with you before, and we are still happy uh, to work with you now for, uh, for the benefit of Mindanao and USA, of course. So, at this point, let us hear the message of support and commitment from the president of the Association of Mindanao Rural Electric Cooperatives, or AMREC. Uh, let us all welcome President Jose Raul Saniel to deliver his message. Uh, good morning, uh, good noon. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. And before I give my AMREC's uh, commitment of support a message, 
there are personalities that I would like to extend my greetings, of course. Secretary Manuel Pinyolo Minda, DOE Secretary Alfonso Pusi, um, Chairperson, ERC Chairperson uh, Agnes uh, De Banadera, May Administrator Gardong Sungsong. Of course, uh, we have also USEC uh, Janet Lopez Minda. Mr. John Edgar, who just uh, gave the overview of the project, and Ms. Divina Chinquanco, the ESP Chief of Party, who gave a very comprehensive uh, brief of uh, the project. And of course, to the other, the, the other distinguished uh, participants as we convene for the Mindanao Power Forum 2021 with a theme, Build Back Better Mindanao, a sustainable and more resilient power landscape. I'd like to congratulate um, the Mindanao Development Authority through the Mindanao Power Monitoring Committee, the other key stakeholders for organizing the, uh, the holding of this very important event. We all know that in the development process of any country, energy is an indispensable and essential element to any sustainable national development. It carries with it the blessings of progress in just about every aspect of the life of the people in economic activities, education, communication, transportation, food production, and in today's universal trust on technological advancement. Indeed, the energy sector has boosted the rapid development landscape by promoting the growth of industries and the healthy flourishings of trade and commerce in the country, particularly here in the island of Mindanao. It has been a vital call that stimulated progress in urban center as well as in the rural areas. It is, however, important to consider that while Mindanao enjoyed economic progress. Its energy landscape is uh, undergoing gradual transformation, such as from environment of largely or dominated by coal plants to a mix of energy made up of renewable energy sources. We also have the soon to be implemented uh, fully operational Mindanao energy market, the wholesale electricity spot market, and another is the compliance to renewable portfolio standards and the expected uh, implementation of the retail competition and open access or ACOA among other developments. And of course, we, we, we foresee also uh, the, the interconnection of the integration of the Mindanao grid to the Luzon and Visayas grid. So all this sector landscape changes or transformations in Mindanao have accompanying challenges. And these challenges are in the areas of energy resiliency, security, renewable energy development, sustaining the, sustaining the rural electrification program, energy sector policy regulation, among other areas. And these challenges are expected to exert pressure on the power industry, its players, stakeholders, and consumers. While industry players have made necessary adjustments, new market realities are expected to emerge, such as, of course, looking for new revenue stream models, changes in consumption patterns, price of electricity, changing customer expectations, technological advancements, policies and regulations, among others. It is worth mentioning that we are facing these challenges against the backdrop of the present COVID-19 pandemic condition and will continue in the post-COVID economic environment where we expected to achieve economic growth recovery. It is in these conditions that USAID's Energy Secure Philippines project is very timely and relevant. As presented earlier, the project aims to foster creation of competitive energy market and enhance resilience and security of energy supply through partnership with key stakeholders, capacity building of power utilities, information sharing and communication, 
utilization of advanced energy sources and systems and others. The project promotes wide range economic development for Mindanao. Another important feature is that the project is anchored in multi-stakeholder engagement as it involves the government, private sector developers, power and electricity utilities, and civil society leaders to improve the reliability, resilience, security, and sustainability of Mindanao's energy sector. And it is to be stressed that multi-sectoral stakeholder cooperation and participation are key to understanding and resolving energy-related issues, thus ensuring synergies and progress. It is expected that the project will serve as a catalyst for economic growth and development. It envisions to attract robust private investments in Mindanao, promotion of technology, refinement or creation of an enabling policy regulatory and legal environment, enabling energy sector resiliency and security, which can withstand natural and market economic shocks. On behalf of AMRECO and its 34 member electric cooperatives, we thank the USAID for its unwavering commitment to empowering the energy, Philippine energy sector through the Philippine uh, Secure Philippines project. We also welcome and are very thankful for the opportunity for AMRECO to be part of this novel project. AMRECO extends its unequivocal solidarity with the principles and objectives of the project and extends its assurance that AMRECO is fully committed to work toward the success of this project actively. We also take cognizance of the significance of building partnerships and working with the other stakeholders. It is through these collaborations that we could draw strength to achieve our development goals. So thank you so much USAID, thank you Minda and other partner stakeholders and mabuhay tayong lahat. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much po. Uh, Mr. Saniel, the president of the Association of Mindanao Rural Electric cooperatives. Thank you very much. Thank Mark. you. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's already 12.08 at noon. Okay. Um, we will be taking a break for lunch for one hour. Uh, we will be coming back at, we will be restarting the program this afternoon at one. Okay. So based on the program, we will have technical sessions this afternoon. This is the right time to post your questions and have them addressed by the right speakers, okay? Not just to give an answer, but to give an informed, contextualized answer to all these issues. Okay? We really appreciate your feedback here on the uh, chat, chat box, okay? If you don't agree, say it and explain why. And you can also add your suggestions on how to fix this problem in order to help the policymakers and regulators as a sort of constructive criticism, okay? If you like what they said or their plans and their programs, you can also mention it on the chat box as well. So they will know that they're doing the right thing, that you agree with what they're doing and that you're supporting what they, whatever it is that they are doing. So again, uh, we will be taking a break for an hour. We will be coming back at one o'clock for this afternoon's technical sessions. Have a nice day, enjoy your lunch. And thank you for participating to the uh, Mindanao Power Forum 2020. Mga kaibigan, mayroon ang Mindanao. In fact, if only you will have the time to move around Mindanao, makikita mo yung potential ng isla na ito. For example, ito ang tanyag na Maria Cristina Falls. Ito po ay makikita sa ilog na ang tawag nila ay Agos River. Galing po ng Lake Lanao yung tubig at dumadaloy. Noong 1953, ito pong Agos River ay pinagawan ng 
hydro power dam. Simula noon, pitong dams na po ang uh, ipinatayo along Agos River. Ang total power generation ng Agos River Hydro Power Complex, 727 megawatts. That is one-third of the total power requirement of Mindanao. Tingnan po natin ang Maria Cristina Falls at i-discover natin ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Kailan ginawa yung Agu 6? Uh, it was commissioned by the former President Elpidio Quirino, sir. Uh -huh. And the first unit, if I'm not mistaken, operated, commercially operated in 1960s. That would be Unit 1 and 2. Uh -huh. And Unit 3, 4, 5 uh, followed during the 1970s. Okay. So, bali pito na ito ngayon? Uh, lima lang, sir. Lima? Lima dito sa Agu 6, dalawa sa Agu 7, sir. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, anong total power generation natin? Just for Agu 6 and 7 only, sir, we have around 250 megawatts of installed capacity, sir. Pero simulan doon sa taas? Ah, okay. Dito. From Agu 1 to Agu 7, sir, we would be having a total of 727 megawatts of power, sir. Ang laking contribution nga sa Mindanao. Ay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Was there a time na nag, uh, nagka-problema kayo dahil mababa yung tubig o whatever? Uh, it was only, I think, around 1970s. I'm not very sure kasi hindi pa ako pinanganak nun, sir. <laughs> yung drought sa Mindanao, sir, uh, if you can remember. Uh, uh, ah, siguro, sir, bata-bata ka pa rin nun, sir, no? Wala pa kaya po ba doon? Yes, sir. So, I think that would be the only time that we could consider that there was a critical level in terms uh -huh. of the water supply. Okay. But often, on regular days, basta okay lang, walang problema sa, ba sa mga basura or any other things, uh, we are operating at very good capacity. But as of the moment, sir, as we have established that early on in 1960s, nag-operate na yung units natin. So that would make our units as old as 40 years old. And we know that the feasible economic life of any generating units would only run about 25 years. So I think our units are already long overdue. Oh, yes. But that was the year na na-commission yung unang... Uh, yes, sir hydropower uh, yes, generation sir. facility. Yes, sir. But recently, sir, we had a project for regarding for Unit 1 to because it was the oldest unit here in the whole uh, Agus complex. It was, uh, we cannot say replaced, but we can say uprated. Uh -huh. No civil structure was altered whatsoever, but the internal mechanisms of the entire, gener entire generating unit was successfully uh, rehabilitated. But the project was not handled by NPC, but by PISAM. So it was rehabilitated and right now we are running uh, with unit 1 and unit number 2. Okay. Yes, sir. So so far lately wala na kayong problema. So far sir, uh, minor difficulties here and there. Normal man talaga yan sir basta magpa ano tayo when we are running mechanical machines. So but anything major, I think there are no notable uh, major problems that we are encountering so far. Okay. Yes, sir. thank you. Yes sir. Mga kaibigan, nakita nyo ang isang yaman ng Mindanao. Maria Cristina Falls, Agos Hydro Power Complex. Total power generation, 727 megawatts. That's a lot of power. And this is actually one of the sources of power of Mindanao. Kulang pa ito sapagkat ang requirement ng Mindanao is 2,000 megawatts. But with this, sigurado tayong uh, aasenso ang Mindanao. At pagdating ng panahon, lahat ng mga ito, ng mga proyektong ito, ay makakatulong sa pagunlad ng Mindanao at pagkamit ng kapayapaan. Ganyan po kayaman ng Mindanao. Ito po ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Sa ngalan ng Mindanao Development Authority, ako po si Secretary Manny Pinyol, nagasabing, let us continue to discover the beauty and bounty of Mindanao.
Sa first day nga nagitauran mi, uh, na excited kay mi nangandam para ipakaon sa nagstalar sa amuang suga. Excited kay mi og nalipay kay mi dako. Dako kayo og kausaban kaning maong uh, programa proyekto nga gihatod din sa Barangay Little Baguio. Kay ang Little Baguio ang pinakalayo nga barangay sa musipyo sa Malita, Davao Occidental. Kay mostly nagpuyo din sa Barangay Little Baguio 90% ang Blaan tribe. Kay sa wala pang solar Walay kahayag ang mga tao diri bisan sa ilang mga balay edukasyon nila wala gyud among nakita maayo gyud kaayo ang impact sa among asosasyon tungod sa machine kay na doble na time is to ang among income maningkamot ang among uma para ang atong for seller o ground right ground grinder o atong kanang buladan ug mais do not malubo in Sitio Little Baguio, Sitio Mahayag, Davao Occidental, 1,475 solar home systems have been installed. 111 of 136 in Sitio New Mabuhay households earning through abaca farming. Solar PV powered mechanized abaca spindle machines. Community of 98 households involved in corn farming were provided solar powered corn sheller, miller, and biomass fire dryer. Nakaingon migani nga hulog man ni si Rogi kan sa langit siguro nga serving na atag sa mga direkta sukad pa sinugdanan. Wala man ni may tabo. Karun, aduna na kami paglaong para sa mas mahayag na kaugmaon. Mindanao's economy is agriculture-based with an average 30% contribution to gross regional domestic product. Based on the Mindanao Jobs Report of World Bank, 6 out of 10 jobs are agriculture-related, but the sad thing is 8 out of 10 poor in Mindanao are farmers or fisher folks. Contributing to this condition, our agriculture productivity is not optimized due to lack of access of production areas to processing centers and market, farm-to-market roads, including access to water supply for drinking and irrigation, among other socio-economic challenges. A thousand barangays are considered waterless based on the combined report of the DILG and USAID water program reports. Based on PSA data, 56% of Mindanao's potential irrigable areas need to be developed. About their water supply problem. I saw that water uh, usually are being sourced from the shallow well, from the deep well, the spring developments. So imagine 1987, 13 plus 19, that's how many years na ago. And our provincial go, uh, province has not yet met even the most basic requirements for water of the population, which is the potable water for the households. We have not even counted in the need for commercial establishments. Yung pangailangan ng mga negosyante, hotels, restaurants, and the others. And much more, if we go industrialization, tourism province pa naman kami, we need a lot of uh, facilities, and we go to industrialization, we need very, very sufficient in water para pumasok yung mga companies. No company, no hotel will come in 
wala ako. 28 out of 35 barangay have no access to the water. The Mindanao Water Supply Program can assist us through sourcing and reference. Tapos na yung mga challenges namin doon na medyo nakita namin, unang-una sa electricity. <coughs> Kasi nakikita namin ngayon na baka malaking babayaran namin sa electricity. Kaya naisip namin na yung sinasabi nila ngayon yung sa solar, na baka pwede ano doon na may ano sila ata ngayon yung hybrid. Eh. Pwede na araw, solar, paggabi, electricity. Sa Ghana at Ligtas na Tubig sa Lahat or Salin Tubig Program, a pro-poor collaboration of DILG, NAPSI, LWUA, and DOH to provide safe water to waterless areas. BSWM and NIA providing technical and financial assistance to LGUs on the development and rehabilitation of small-scale irrigation systems. MINDA, in partnership with DILG and financial institutions such as DBP, will work together through the Mindanao Water Supply Program or MINDA Water to provide LGUs with technical and financial options for safe water supply. The program will contribute to peace, prosperity, and poverty reduction for the farmers and fisher folks in Mindanao. Specifically, the program aims to increase income of fisher folks and farmers in Mindanao's isolated and remote areas, improve access to water supply for drinking and for irrigation, and enhance governance capacities of target LGUs. The program offers three packages of interventions depending on the need of the LGU. Potable water supply package, water desalination system, water treatment plant, water source development, communal water supply system, household level water system, irrigation system package, development or rehabilitation or repair of small scale irrigation system coupled with environmentally friendly technology and capacity building. Potable water and irrigation systems package, combination of water supply and irrigation system interventions. The program will also engage the Mindanao Knowledge Center, which is a consortium of state universities and colleges in Mindanao, to assist the LGUs in the conduct of water availability study in the locality. I am hopeful that through Mindas initiative and intervention, especially the potable water supply and irrigation, social economic development of each and our mind is very really good. The message for Minda is keep it up, Secretary Mani Pignon. You are in the right track and we are uh, the provincial on behalf of the governor. We will be supporting Minda as you support as well our province in, in the different undertakings. In 2016, the European Union committed about 60 million euros to support the government of the Philippines in implementing a program to increase access to electricity in remote areas, promote the use of renewable energy, and intensify application of energy efficient strategies. The PV mainstreaming initiative of ASAP being implemented by the World Bank will install over 40,500 solar home systems in remote households in Mindanao to provide basic electricity services. Pagkapait sa among kinabuhi sa una, pirmi lang gaapa sa oras, gagukod sa adlaw para mapaigo ang tanan na kinahanglan himuun. Lisod yun ang kahimtang na walay suga. Mura ang adlaw nga 24 oras, paiguon ra sa 12 ka oras. Muloy ko sa akong mga anak nga gadako sa kangit-ngit. Sa kangiob, ngit-ngit nga palibot, ngit-ngit nga panimalay, ngit-ngit nga kaugmaon. Sa 
among kaintang kung pati na magabot ang kagabiyon. Amo madungog gangis lang sa mga manggoy. Pero ang suga in taon nga mao mong yun kaintang yun sa tao kung nasa sa atong balay. Pero usaon man kayo may kaabot ng taon. Usay mahimo uh, magtutul man may kahoy isugyo lang namo diha nga para himo na mong suga. pang solar walay kahayag ang mga tao diri bisan sa ilang mga balay edukasyon nila wala gyud ang productive use of energy project team ng Access to Sustainable Energy program nakapasok dito sa Sitio Nyo Mabuhay Barangay Little Baguio uh, Malita Davao Occidental kasi nakita namin na ang uh, sitio na ito ay highly qualified para makabenepisyo ng ating Productive Views Project. Ito Productive Views Project, isa sa mga pilot projects ng ASEP para matulungan natin ang mga tao na nakareceive ng solar energization uh, galing dun sa PV mainstreaming project natin. So, daku kayong kalayian, daku kayo o kausaban, kaning maong uh, programa, proyekto nga gihatod din sa Barangal Little Baguio. Kaya ang Little Baguio ang pinakalayo ng barangay sa musipyo sa Malita, Tabo Occidental. Kaya mostly nagpuyo din sa barangay Little Baguio, 90% ang blaan tribe. Pero ang problema, nahihirapan sila na makaahon sa kahirapan nila ng pag-aabaka dahil mano-mano lang. So nakita namin para masuportahan ang kanilang income na sila, sila ay pwedeng makareceive ng makina. No? Makina na kung saan magiging mas mataas ang value ng kanilang produkto. Kinumabuhay identified abaka as the major income generating activity of the net income of households must be higher than what they are. Uh, sa among asosasyon, 80%. O, among nakita, maayog yun kaayo ang impact sa among asosasyon tungod sa machine. Kay na dubli na time is to ang among income. Sa first day nga nagitauran mi uh, na excited kay mi nanganda para ipakaon sa nagstellar sa amuang suga. Excited kay mi og nalipay kay mi dako. Daghan sila yung mga plano nga uh, gusto nila mabalit sila mga appliances sa mga TV, sa mga uh, mga karaoke ampli. corn shiller o katong corn grinder kaupon sa nakahitik sa unang panahon kita ninyo nga mga mag-uuma halos na lang ang atong mga kamot mga lubo sa dimano, mga paglubo pinagi sa dimano karon inyo na masaksiyan din eh sa gamay nga equipo mapasulod ang isa kamais o malubo na pinagi lang sa solar panel oh, pero nagpasalamat ka sa ila na nagsakripisyo sila Nilusot sila din ni Aron Pagtabang kanato kay nakita nila nga atong kahintang din ni Lisod kayo. Ang ginahatag na kanato din ni nga mga proyekto para sa atong Panginoon na kandidat o mga milyon-milyon. Kita ang pinakabulahan nga Sityo Barangay Baluntaya o Sityo Maya. In Sityo Little Baguio, Sityo Mahayag, Davao Occidental, 1,475 solar home systems have been installed. 111 of 136 in Sitio New Mabuhay households earning through abaca farming. Solar PV powered mechanized abaca spindle machines. Community of 98 households involved in corn farming were provided solar powered corn sheller, miller, and biomass fire dryer. sa among gyangyo nga ang atong proyekto nga gihatag diri sa asik atong ampingan og mayo inahanglan nga magmalahutay hangtod sa umabot natong mga henerasyon maningkamot ang mag-uma para ang atong corn chiller o corn right corn grinder o atong kanang buladan og mais do natay malubo do natay magaling og do natay mabulat para mabaligya sa merkado murag ayahay na kay ni abot na ang kahayag gikan didto sa inyo ha 
nakaingon may gani nga hulog man ni si Rogi kan sa langit siguro yung uh, serving na atay sa mga adalit kaya sukat pa sinugdanan wala man ni may tabo Karon, aduna na kami paglaum para sa mas mahayag na kaugmaon. Kaibigan, mayaman ang Bintanao. In fact, if only you will have the time to move around Mindanao, makikita mo yung potential ng isla na ito. For example, ito ang tanyag na Maria Cristina Falls. Ito po ay makikita sa ilog na ang tawag nila ay Agos River. Galing po ng Lake Lanao yung tubig at dumadaloy. Noong 1953, ito pong Agos River ay pinagawan ng hydropower dam. Simula noon, pitong dams na po ang uh, ipinatayo along Agos River. Ang total power generation ng Agos River Hydropower Complex, 727 megawatts. That is one-third of the total power requirement of Mindanao. Tingnan po natin ang Maria Cristina Falls at i-discover natin ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Kailan ginawa yung Ago 6? Uh, it was commissioned by the former President Elpidio Quirino, sir. Uh -huh. And the first unit, if I'm not mistaken, operated, commercially operated in 1960s. That would be Unit 1 and 2. And Unit 345 followed during the 1970s. Okay. So, bali pito na ito ngayon? Ah, lima lang, sir. Lima? Lima dito sa Agu 6, dalawa sa Agu 7, sir. Ah, okay. Yes, sir. So, anong total power generation natin? Just for Agu 6 and 7 only, sir, we have around 250 megawatts of installed capacity, sir. Pero simulan doon sa taas? Ah, okay. Okay. From August 1 to August 7, sir, we would be having a total of 727 megawatts of power, sir. Ang laking contribution niya sa Mindanao. Ay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Was there a time na nagka-problema kayo dahil mababa yung tubig o whatever? It was only, I think, around 1970s. I'm not very sure kasi hindi pa ako pinanganap nun, sir. Yung drought sa Mindanao, sir, if you can remember. Siguro, sir, bata-bata ka pa rin nun, sir. Wala pa kiyapukad doon. Wala pa. Uh, yes, sir. So I think that would be the only time that we could consider that there was a critical level in terms uh -huh. of the water supply. Okay. But often, on regular days, basta okay lang, walang problema sa, ba sa mga basura or any other things, uh, we are operating at very good capacity. But as of the moment, sir, as we have established that early on in 1960s, nag-operate na yung units natin. So that would make our units as old as 40 years old. And we know that the feasible economic life of any generating units would only run about 25 years. So I think our units are already long overdue. Oh yes. So that was the year na na commission yung unang hydropower generation facility. Yes sir. But recently sir, we had a project regarding for unit 1-2 because it was the oldest unit here in the whole Agus complex. It was, we cannot say replaced, but we can say uprated No civil structure was altered whatsoever, but the internal mechanisms of the entire, gener entire generating unit was successfully uh, rehabilitated. But the project was not handled by NPC, but by PISAM. 
So it was rehabilitated, and right now we are running uh, with unit one and unit number two. Okay. Yes. Sir. So so far lately, what are the problem? So far, sir, uh, minor difficulties here and there. Normal man talaga yan, sir. Basta magta ano tayo when we are running mechanical machines. So, but anything major, I think there are no notable uh, major problems that we are encountering so far. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mga kaibigan, nakita nyo ang isang yaman ng Mindanao. Maria Cristina Falls. Agos Hydro Power Complex. Total power generation, 727 megawatts. That's a lot of power. And this is actually one of the sources of power of Mindanao. Kulang pa ito sapagkat ang requirement ng Mindanao is 2,000 megawatts. But with this, sigurado tayong uh, aasenso ang Mindanao. At pagdating ng panahon, lahat ng mga ito, ng mga proyekto nito, ay makakatulong sa pagunlad ng Mindanao at pagkamit ng kapayapaan. Ganyan po kayaman ng Mindanao. Ito po ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Sa ng Mindanao Development Authority, ako po si Secretary Manny Pinyol, nagasabing, let us continue to discover the beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Sa first day nga nagitauran mi uh, na excited kay mi nangandam para ipakaon sa nagstalar sa amuang suga. Excited kay mi og nalipay kay mi dako. Dako kayo og kausaban kaning maong uh, programa proyekto nga gihatod dinhi sa Barangay Little Baguio. Kay ang Little Baguio ang pinakalayo nga barangay sa musipyo sa Malita. Tabo Occidental. Okay, mostly nagpuyo din sa Barangay Little Baguio, 90% ang Blaan Tribe. Ay sa wala pang solar, walay kahayag ang mga tao diri. Bisan sa ilang mga balay, edukasyon nila, wala yun. Among nakita, maayog yun kaayo ang impact sa among asosasyon tungkol sa machine. Kaya nadubli na, time is to ang among income. Maningkamot ang amang uma para ang atong corn chiller o corn grinder o atong kanang buladan o mais doon natin malubo, doon natin magaling o doon natin mabulat para mabalik yan sa merkado. In Sitio Little Baguio, Sitio Mahayag, Davao Occidental, 1,475 solar home systems have been installed. 111 of 136 in Sitio New Mabuhay households earning through Apaca Farming. Solar PV powered mechanized abaca spindle machines. Community of 98 households involved in corn farming were provided solar powered corn sheller, miller, and biomass fire dryer. Nakaingon mi gani nga hulog man ni sirugi kan sa langit siguro nga serving na atag sa mga direkta sukad pa sinugdanan wala man ni may tabo. Karon, aduna na kami paglaom para sa mas mahayag na kaugmaon.
Mindanao's economy is agriculture-based, with an average 30% contribution to gross regional domestic product. Based on the Mindanao Jobs Report of World Bank, six out of ten jobs are agriculture-related. But the sad thing is, eight out of ten poor in Mindanao are farmers or fisher folks. Contributing to this condition, our agriculture productivity is not optimized due to lack of access of production areas to processing centers and market, farm-to-market roads, including access to water supply for drinking and irrigation, among other socio-economic challenges. A thousand barangays are considered waterless based on the combined report of the DILG and USAID Water Program reports. Based on PSA data, 56% of Mindanao's potential irrigable areas need to be developed. About their water supply problem, I saw that water uh, usually are being sourced from the shallow well, from the deep well, the spring developments. So imagine 1987, 13 plus 19. That's how many years na ago. And our provincial go, uh, province has not yet met even the most basic requirements for water of the population, which is the potable water for the households. We have not even counted in the need for commercial establishments. Yung pangailangan ng mga negosyante hotels, restaurants, and the others. And much more, if we go industrialization, tourism province pa naman kami, we need a lot of uh, facilities, and we go to industrialization, we need very, very sufficient in water para pumasok yung mga companies. No company, no hotel will come in to wala kang food. 28 out of 35 barangay, have no access to double water. The Mindanao Water Supply Program can assist us through sourcing and reference. Tapos na yun, yung mga challenges namin doon na medyo nakita namin, unang-una sa electricity. <coughs> Kasi nakikita namin ngayon na baka malaking babayaran namin sa electricity. Kaya naisip namin na yung sinasabi nila ngayon yung sa solar, na baka pwede ano doon na may ano sila ata ngayon yung hybrid eh. Pwede na araw, solar, paggabi, electricity. Sa Gana at Ligtas na Tubig sa Lahat or Salin Tubig Program, a pro-poor collaboration of DILG, NAPSI, LWUA, and DOH to provide safe water to waterless areas. BSWM and NIA providing technical and financial assistance to LGUs on the development and rehabilitation of small-scale irrigation systems. MINDA, in partnership with DILG and financial institutions such as DBP, will work together through the Mindanao Water Supply Program, or MINDA Water, to provide LGUs with technical and financial options for safe water supply. The program will contribute to peace, prosperity, and poverty reduction for the farmers and fisher folks in Mindanao. Specifically, the program aims to increase income of fisher folks and farmers in Mindanao's isolated and remote areas, improve access to water supply for drinking and for irrigation, and enhance governance capacities of target LGUs. The program offers three packages of interventions depending on the need of the LGU. Potable water supply package, water desalination system, water treatment plant, water source development, communal water supply system, household level water system, irrigation system package, development or rehabilitation or repair of small scale irrigation system coupled with environmentally friendly technology and capacity building. Potable water and irrigation systems package combination of water supply and irrigation system interventions. The program will also engage the Mindanao Knowledge Center, which is a consortium of state universities and colleges in Mindanao, to assist the LGUs in the conduct of water availability study in the locality. I am hopeful that through Mindanao, 
initiative and information, especially the potable water supply and irrigation, social and economic development of the channel mine is within the nation. The message for Minda is keep it up, Secretary Manny Pignol. You are in the right track and we are uh, the provincial on behalf of the governor. We will be supporting Minda as you support as well our province in, in the different undertakings. In 2016, the European Union committed about 60 million euros to support the government of the Philippines in implementing a program to increase access to electricity in remote areas, promote the use of renewable energy, and intensify application of energy-efficient strategies. The PV mainstreaming initiative of ASAP, being implemented by the World Bank, will install over 40,500 solar home systems in remote households in Mindanao to provide basic electricity services. Pagkapait sa among kinabuhi sa una, pirmi lang gaapa sa oras, gagukod sa adlaw para mapaigo ang tanan na kinahanglan himuon. Lisod yun ang kahimtang na walay suga. Mura ang adlaw nga 24 oras, paiguon ra sa 12 ka oras. Maloy ko sa akong mga anak nga gadako sa kangit-ngit. Sa kangiob, ngit-ngit nga palibot, ngit-ngit nga panimalay, ngit-ngit nga kaugmaon. Among kaintang kung pati na mag-abot ang kagabiyon, ang madungog gangis lang sa mga manggoy. Pero ang suga in taon, na maumong yun na kaintang yun sa tao kung nata sa atong balay. Pero usahon man kayo, may kaabot yung taon. Kung sa'yo mahimo, magkutul na may kahoy, isuglo lang na mo diha, na para himo na mong suga. pang solar walay kahayag ang mga tao diri bisan sa ilang mga balay edukasyon nila wala gyud ang productive use of energy project team ng access to sustainable energy program nakapasok dito sa sitio nyo mabuhay barangay Little Baguio uh, Malita Davao Occidental kasi nakita namin na ang uh, sitio na ito ay highly qualified para makabenepisyo ng ating Productive Views Project. Ito Productive Views Project, isa sa mga pilot projects ng ASEP para matulungan natin ang mga tao na nakareceive ng solar energization uh, galing dun sa PV mainstreaming project natin. So, daku kayong kalayian, daku kayo o kausaban, kaning maong uh, programa, proyekto nga gihatod din sa Barangal Little Baguio. Kaya ang Little Baguio ang pinakalayo ng barangay sa musipyo sa Malita, Tabo Occidental. Kaya mostly nagpuyo din sa barangay Little Baguio, 90% ang Blaan Tribe. Pero ang problema, nahihirapan sila na makaahon sa kahirapan nila ng pag-aabaka dahil mano-mano lang. So nakita namin para masuportahan ang kanilang income na sila, sila ay pwedeng makareceive ng makina. No? Makina na kung saan magiging mas mataas ang value ng kanilang produkto. Kinumabuhay identified abaka as the major income generating activity of the net income of households must be higher than what they are currently getting on a monthly basis. So the technology identified uses solar power and this is the mechanized abaca spindle machines. Sa among asosasyon adu nami machines abaca o moto nga nami share sa maintenance sa repairing 10% sa among 
sa dasuri ko 10% ug sa amo ang sa among asosasyon 80%. Ug among nakita maayo gyud kaayo ang impact sa among asosasyon tungod sa machine. Kay na doble nag time is to ang among income. Sa first day nga nagitauran mi ah uh, Na excited kay mi nangandam para ipakaon sa nagstalar sa amuang suga. Excited kay mi og nalipay kay mi dako. Daghan sila yung mga plano nga uh, gusto nila mabalit sila mga appliances sa mga TV, sa mga sa uh, mga karaoke ampli. Corn <laughs> Nilusot sila din ni Aron Pagtabang Kanato kay nakita nila nga atong kahintang din ni Lisod kayo. Ang ginahatag na Kanato din ni nga mga proyekto para sa atong Panginagawin na kandidat o mga milyon-milyon. Kita ang pinakabulahan nga sityo barangay baluntaya o sityo maya. In sityo Little Baguio, sityo Mahayag, Davao Occidental, 1,475 solar home systems have been installed. 111 of 136 in Sitio New Mabuhay households earning through abaca farming. Solar PV powered mechanized abaca spindle machines. Community of 98 households involved in corn farming were provided solar powered corn sheller, miller, and biomass fire dryer. sa among yangyo nga ang atong proyekto nga gihatag diri sa asik atong ampingan og mayo inahanglan nga magmalahutay hangtod sa maabot natong mga henerasyon maningkamot ang mga uma para ang atong corn chiller o corn right corn grinder o atong kanang buladan og mais do natay malubo do natay magaling og do natay mabulat para mabalik sa merkado murag ayahay na kay ni abot na ang kahayag gikan dito sa inyo ha nakaingon mi gani nga hulog man ni si rugi kan sa langit siguro nga serving na atag sa mga adalit kay sukat pa sinugdanan, wala man yung may tabo. Karon, aduna na kami paglaum para sa mas mahayag na kaugmaon. Kaibigan, mayaman ang Bintanao. In fact, if only you will have the time to move around Mindanao, makikita mo yung potential ng isla na ito. For example, ito ang tanyag na Maria Cristina Falls. Ito po'y makikita sa ilog na ang tawag nila ay Agos River. Galing po ng Lake Lanao yung tubig at dumadaloy Noong 1953, ito pong Agos River ay pinagawan ng hydropower dam. Simula noon, pitong dams na po ang uh, ipinatayo along Agos River. Ang total power generation ng Agos River Hydropower Complex 
727 megawatts. That is one-third of the total power requirement of Mindanao. Tingnan po natin ang Maria Cristina Falls at i-discover natin ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Kailan ginawa yung Ago 6? Ah, uh, it was commissioned by the former President Elpidio Quirino, sir. Uh -huh. And the first unit, if I'm not mistaken, operated, commercially operated in 1960s. That would be Unit 1 and 2. Uh -huh. And Unit 3, 4, 5 uh, followed during the 1970s. Okay. So, bali pito na ito ngayon? Ah, uh, lima lang, sir. Lima? Lima dito sa Ago 6, dalawa sa Ago 7, sir. Ah, uh, okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, anong total power generation natin? Just for Agus 6 and 7 only, sir, we have around 250 megawatts of installed capacity, sir. Pero simula doon sa taas? Ah, okay. Dito. From Agus 1 to Agus 7, sir, we would be having a total of 727 megawatts of power, sir. Ang laking contribution nga sa Mindanao. Ay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Was there a time na nag, uh, nagka-problema kayo dahil mababa ang tubig o what ano? Uh, it was only, I think, around 1970s. I'm not very sure kasi hindi pa ako pinanganap nun, sir. <laughs> Yung drought sa Mindanao, sir, uh, if you okay. can remember. Uh, ah, siguro, sir, bata-bata ka pa rin nun, sir, no? Wata uh, tayo, sir. Wala, pa, wala pag ako ka doon. Ah, wala pa. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, sir. So, I think that would be the only time that we could consider that there was a critical level in terms uh -huh. of the water supply. Okay. But often, on regular days, basta okay lang, walang problema sa, ba sa mga basura or any other things, uh, we are operating at very good capacity. But as of the moment, sir, as we have established that early on in 1960s, nag-operate na yung units natin. So that would make our units as old as 40 years old. And we know that the feasible economic life of any generating units would only run about 25 years. So I think our units are already long overdue. Oh, yes. Okay, so that was the year na hmm. the commission yung unang... Uh, yes, sir. Hydropower uh, yes, generation sir. facility. Yes, sir. But recently, sir, we had a project for regarding for Unit 1 2 because it was the oldest unit here in the whole uh, Agus complex. It was, uh, we cannot say replaced, but we can say uprated. Uh -huh. No civil structure was altered whatsoever, but the internal mechanisms of the entire, uh, entire generating unit was successfully uh, rehabilitated. But the project was not handled by NPC, but by PISAM. So it was rehabilitated and right now we are running uh, with unit 1 and unit number 2. Okay. Yes, sir. So so far lately wala na kayong problema. So far sir, uh, minor difficulties here and there normal man talaga yan sir basta magpa ano tayo when we are running mechanical machines. So but anything major I think there are no notable uh, major problems that we are encountering so far. Okay. Yes, sir. thank you. Yes sir. Mga kaibigan, nakita nyo ang isang yaman ng Mindanao. Maria Cristina Falls, Agos Hydro Power Complex. Total power generation, 727 megawatts. That's a lot of power. And this is actually one of the sources of power of Mindanao. Kulang pa ito sapagkat ang requirement ng Mindanao is 2,000 megawatts. But with this, sigurado tayong uh, aasenso ang Mindanao. At pagdating ng panahon, lahat ng mga ito, ng mga proyekto nito, ay makakatulong sa pagunlad ng Mindanao at pagkamit ng kapayapaan. Ganyan po kayaman ng Mindanao. Ito po ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Sa ngala ng Mindanao Development Authority, ako po si Secretary Manny Pinyol, nagasabing, let us continue to discover the beauty and bounty of Mindanao.
sa first day nga nagitauran mi uh, na excited kay mi nangandam para ipakaon sa nagstalar sa amuang suga excited kay mi og nalipay kay mi dako dako kayo og kausaban kaning maong uh, programa proyekto nga gihatod dinhi sa barangay Little Bagyo kay ang Little Bagyo ang pinakalayo nga barangay sa musipyo sa Malita Tabo Occidental kay mostly nagpuyo dinhi sa barangay Little Bagyo 90% ang Blaan Tribe kay sa wala pang solar Walay kahayag ang mga tao diri. Bisan sa ilang mga balay, edukasyon nila, wala yun. Among nakita, maayo yun kaayo ang impact sa among asosasyon tungkol sa machine. Kaya nadubli na, time is to ang among income. Maningkamot ang amang uma para ang atong corn sealer o corn grinder o atong kanang buladan o mais doon natin malubo. Doon tayo magaling o doon tayo mabulat para mabaligya sa katano. In Sitio Little Baguio, Sitio Mahayag, Davao Occidental, 1,475 solar home systems have been installed. 111 of 136 in Sitio New Mabuhay households earning through abaca farming. Solar PV-powered mechanized abaca spindle machines. Community of 98 households involved in corn farming were provided solar-powered corn sheller, miller, and biomass fire dryer. Nakaingon mi gani nga hulog man ni si Rogi kan sa langit siguro nga serving na atag sa mga adalik kay sukad pa sinugdanan. Wala man ni may tabo. Karun, aduna na kami paglaong para sa mas mahayag na kaugmaon. Mindanao's economy is agriculture-based with an average 30% contribution to gross regional domestic product. Based on the Mindanao Jobs Report of World Bank, 6 out of 10 jobs are agriculture-related, but the sad thing is 8 out of 10 poor in Mindanao are farmers or fisher folks. Contributing to this condition, our agriculture productivity is not optimized due to lack of access of production areas to processing centers and market, farm-to-market roads, including access to water supply for drinking and irrigation, among other socio-economic challenges. A thousand barangays are considered waterless based on the combined report of the DILG and USAID water program reports. Based on PSA data, 56% of Mindanao's potential irrigable areas need to be developed. About their water supply problem. I saw that water uh, usually are being sourced from the shallow well, from the deep well, to spring developments. So imagine 1987, 13 plus 19, that's how many years na ago. And our provincial go, uh, province has not yet met even. In 20s. Kasama po natin si Mayor June Roste uh, ng uh, Olotanga. And uh, dadalawin po natin yung isang prospective uh, economic activity ng ating mga mangingisda na hindi masyado nabigyan ng pansin. Alam mo, galing ako ng nawaan ni Samis Oriental Mayor. Doon, uh, sinusubukan nilang mag-breed ng lapu-lapu. Dito pala sa inyo, natural ang breeding ng lapu-lapu. So, uh, saan nag-breed yung lapu-lapu dito? Dito lang sa ano pa, malapit lang. Sa mga ilog. Sa mga ilog. <coughs> ano ang, ano, gaano kadami yung mga 
finger dito na lapu-lapu na. Marami, marami. Marami sa mga oh. ilog. So, anong area sa Ulutanga ang uh, merong marami finger dito? Uh, barangay Mating. Uh -huh. Ilang ilang areas ang marami mayor? Dito, mar barang Barangay Mating at saka doon sa Santa Maria. Ano sa Esperanza? Marami na naman. Santa Maria Esperanza. Ano ba yan? Sisunal? Kung sa kadaghan ang makuha nyo? Kung halimbawa manakop mo, pag pilakalibo nyo manakpan. Depende siya kung mga mga yung manghuli. Aha. Pag sun-sun lang kaya po ng gamit. O, pukot lang kaya po. Ah, pukot. Ito po mga kaibigan ang isang area na kung saan ay pinapalaki nila yung mga lapu-lapu. And galing sa fingerlings na pinapatubo nila doon sa may sinasabi nilang mga natural habitat ng Lapu-Lapu, nililipat nila dito sa uh, area na ito. And uh, ang nangyari, uh, dito daw uh, nagkakakulay. Meron pala itong sekreto. Sapagkat uh, kung nasa juvenile stage pa ang Lapu-Lapu, itim. No? Tama itim ba may? Itim. itim, itim. No? So para magkakulay siya ng may parang tiger na siya, Uh, kailangan ilipat siya sa dagat. dagat uh. Uh, sapagkat doon siya, doon niya kinukuha yung, uh, o doon nagbabago yung kulay niya. No? So ngayong araw po na ito, uh, sinama tayo dito ni uh, Kapitan Taka Sihon, isang uh, okay, sama ng... bangingi, uh, Kapitan ng uh, Barangay Mating. Mating. Mating no? uh, at ito kanya-kanyang ano, kanyang, uh, fish cage ito. Ang pinaparami niya rito, ang pinapalaki niya rito ay lapu-lapu. At itong lapu-lapu na ito, natural na nahuli nila doon sa isang area. Anong area yun, Mayor? Sa Matim. Barangay uh, sa Matim, sa barangay mismo ni Kapitan. No? Marami pa lang mga fingerlings na lapu-lapu doon, hinuhuli lang nila. And uh, nililipat dito para palakihin. Unsa ang proseso sa pagdakop niyo lapu-lapu? Dito sa may imong, imong barangay. Kunsa, kawayan ni una niyo. Ito yung buslutan, mga anak siguro kataan. Mm. So, kada adlaw, doon, doon na ka? Oo, ano yung sikas. Kaya nga, dahil lang doon ha? Buti. Nausahe, kaya dito man sila mo pasok. Usang ang butang yung pagkaon para masulod sila? Usahe, butang anog na isda, butang anog isda, ito nga. Usahe, wala rapod. Wala ra. Pero naghan ng fingerlings sa lapo-lapo sa mong area? Oo. Mga pilang madakpan nyo, halimbawa, sa usang adlaw, isda mate, kung manakop yun mo? Sa una, Siguro, pinakagamay na mga 100. 100 ka fingerlings a day? Okay. A day. Oo. So, nahimu ni nga dako nga livelihood project nyo dito sa Ulutanga. Unsay problema nga nakita ninyo? Nga nung murag nahina ang inyong production? Una, atong pagsugod yun, kaya wala mang goy seminar, sir. So, kuan ka nang direct sa kuan ba sa balas? Dayon, gamay og dako, giusa ra namo. Mm -hmm. Kanon man dayon ning gamay sa dagko. Mo ba? Okay. Oh, sa una nagbuhi ko mga og 10,000 to. Mm -hmm. So after mga 5 to 6 months aming sizing. So nabinlan na lang og mga 5,000 ka pinahalos ang gatunga. Ikaon. Nawala. Uh -huh. So unsa ang technique nga na develop ninyo? Kuan kinanglan sir, inguna ni daw. Kaya nagkandak mami yung seminar, nag-hire me kuha, nagbayad me. Aha. Kaya siya nag-seminar sa inyo? Katong taga kuwan, sir. Sa party minlan, nagbayad me 1.5 kada isa. Oo. So, murag, dosi mami ato katao. So, nag-lecture all day. So, yung nani daw, tapos, every month, sizing. So, kinang lang, pariha-pariha yung kadag ko. Kaon kahon. Kay para dili siya kaunon ang dagmay mm, okay. kanon sa dagko. Mm. Dayon sa feeding, kinanglan dili gyud siya ingon nga pasubraan. Mm -hmm. Kay sa una, kay gusto lagi na mo nga gusto. Paspas mo dako. Halos kadadlaw sige mi feeding. Mm. Nasamot naman daw dili mutubo ang isda. Kinanglan mga 4 to 5 days, usa na pud siya pagkanon. Nga para gutom siya. Oh, dayon estimate ra pud ang pagkaon. Mm -hmm. Kanang, okay. Uh, istorya ko uh, uh, kapitan no uh, gikan sa pagdakop ninyo sa fingerlings dito sa imong barangay unsa unang proseso 
sa pagkuha sa hindi sa pagpadako sa iyang padako i eh, butan sa kuan adre na butan na adre oh pero dito pa sa suba sa suba na mo gi ah okay so Masusog ang tubo sa suba sir kaysa ingon ani ang suba kanang kutong sago lang ya, alat og uh, og uh, oh, tabang unya oh. lapok oh lapok okay lapok ang ubos pila ka bulan bago ni ibalin sa dagat ibalin na mo diri kanang pagtanaw na mo mo kabat na sa mga half kilo atas so good size naman na okay so, mo na nang i-transfer diri okay so after one month pwede man na mo harvest zone kay ang color blue bad naman siya mo balik naman siya sa color niya sa una mm kay dito sa suba itom, itom siya oh. So dili kay marketa bol nang itong wala pula-pula oh, no. Reject, reject, reject na nila. So pag balhin niyo dire, isa duha ka bulan mo balik nang color niya. Naay pula, naay uh, ngana ba? Oh, mga color nga murag murag kuan, murag desert storm. Okay, oh. oh. Okay. Asa ang unsa nga color ang pinakamahal? Katong color brown. Color brown. Medyo na iputik-puntik. Ah, uh, mo tayo pinakamahal. Oh, bagahak. Kanang pula nga lapu-lapu. Mantisya. Ah, sa lawod na siya. Okay. So, Mantisya, mga batang. Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. So, kine kung steady ang merkado, okay ang tap production nyo. Kaya ninyo. Oh, sa, sa una sir, daghang kayo, di lang siguro mga 30 mi ka tao ang kuan halos hmm. diri oh. Puro yun ni Pistin. Lapo-lapo, lapo-lapo. Unsa na kadis kare sa inyo? Ang buyer dayon nawala pud ang lansa kay wa na may biyahe. Mhm. Mm Kasi pay transportation para sa Buanga. Wala na may sakyanan. Mm -hmm. Man pwede i Unsa ang, ang delivery nyo? Live o? Live. Live? So, tapilang kilo sa live? Sa pagkakaroon, katong before nag-lockdown, ang good size ka ng kuwan, tag-1.5. Mm. 1.5 nga to sa 1 kilo. Dayon, 1.1 nga to sa 1.5 is 2,000. Aha. Dayon, 0.6 nga to sa 2 kilos, 2.5. Ginaunsa ninyo pagkuhan, pag-ship uh, nga buhi? Susunod siya, huwag siya lupi. Aha. Dayo po tangan ng ice. Matulog siya? Dili na. Ang langoy na siya. Pero huwag layo, sa buwangga, nagay oksigen ka ng aerator. Aha. Aerator. Ang kabanyera, mga 30 pieces, 40 pieces, bawat isang kabanyera, tayo na siya aerator. Aha. Kung sa barko, pareha to sa una na pa'y hmm. barko na biyahe. Okay. So, uh, ang inyong problema, merkado? Merkado. Ang, ang produksyon pwede, basta na merkado? Oo. Oh. Kung mga 1,000 per kilo, okay na mo, anak? Dipindi sa kuwan, sir. Kung sa bagahak, sa pagkakaroon, sir, diya, na may bodega diya sa talusan, so, pero nila lagi pareha ang kuwan, ang presyo, presyo na iwan to, ay labi na... Ang pinakamahal gyud nga kuan katong before Chinese New Year. Mm. Maabot pa gyud siya hantod 2000 per kilo. Mm. Ang madulong sa mm. Chinese New Year kanang January to February. Mm. Pinakamahal nga presyo nga kanang lapu-lapu nga lain. So mula po sa Ulutanga, uh, bayan ng Ulutanga, isla ng Ulutanga, dito po sa baba ng Sambuanga Sibugay. Ito po ang beauty and bounty of Mindanao. Napakalawak na karagatan, a lot of potentials. The only thing that these people need is a little support and guidance from government. I'm Secretary Manny Pinyol from the Mindanao Development Authority saying that there's a better future for Mindanao. Good afternoon po everyone to all our viewers, participants, and speakers here today and welcome back to the Mindanao Power Forum 2021 with the theme Building Back Better Mindanao, a Sustainable and More Resilient Mindanao Power Landscape. Okay? So this is what's going to happen this afternoon. We're going to have four sessions, three of them technical, and the fourth one we'll be talking about financing towards the end of the program. Okay. 
So the first three sessions will be subdivided into the basic sectors of the power industry. Namely, we're going to have first generation to be followed by transmission and the grid. And then third will be followed, of course, with distribution, uh, talking about our ECs and our EUs. Okay, so um, this is what's going to happen. We will have a, a, a main discussion together with a panel, and then we will have several resource speakers um, discussing their topics. Each in turn, I will introduce all of them at the first. And then after all of them have gone through uh, their presentations, we're going to have a, uh, we're going to respond to the questions posted earlier and uh, during the session. Okay, so. Um, we've already collated the questions raised earlier in the chat box. Okay? We've segregated them according to the appropriate uh, discussion groups. Okay? So generation parent, transmission, and distribution. Okay? So that's what's going to happen. Okay? So we're all going to be nice and courteous and respectful because courtesy and respect begets courtesy and respect. The basic and then the fundamental objective here is that we expect people to respond and respond appropriately. And we know, we know that according to you, basic human behavior, people are more likely to respond positively if we are also positive and constructive in our means. Okay? It's not so much the message that we're trying to get across, but how we deliver that message. Okay? So... Let's just keep in mind the basic objectives. We want those answers. Uh, we want those answers to our questions in a constructive and a positive way so we can all move forward. At the end of the day, lahat po tayo na nandito are consumers. You, me, us, even in the government, we are also paying our electricity bills. Okay? So without further ado, let me just start off the first session for this afternoon. We would learn about achieving a secure and sustainable energy for Mindanao. So we are glad to have the Deputy Chief of Party of the USA Energy Secure Philippines Program, Mr. Enrique Gallardo, as discussant. He will be joined as panelist by Yusek Emanuel Juaneza of the Department of Energy, as well as by Engineer Ronald Abad of the Energy Secure Philippines Program as well as Director Sharon Montanier of the Marketing Operations Service of the Energy Regulatory Commission. Okay. Our first resource speaker is Director Milo Heroche of the Department of Energy, who will be talking about the Mindanao power situation right now, right now. Okay. Next, we have Mr. Edmundo A. Veloso, Jr., the Vice President of the National Power Corporation. Um, he, is, he joined the NEC as a control engineer of Power Barge 102 on March 1981. So, medyo matagal na po siya sa He rose from the ranks, becoming a plant supervisor, superintendent rather, in 1985, until his present designation as vice president for Mindanao Generation. A recipient of the National Power Corporation sponsored scholarship program, he obtained some units of his master's degree in electrical engineering from the University of the Philippines and accepted as a Japanese government Munbusha scholar in 1985. He obtained his full master's degree in electrical engineering and control systems with honors from Oita University in Japan and a master's degree in management with distinction as outstanding graduate from the University of San Jose Recoletos in Cebu City. Next, we also have as one of our resource speakers, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Headquarters Incorporated, we have Mr. Rolando Pacquiao. He's newly appointed, effective June 1 of 2021. He has been with Headquarters since 2011, serving as Vice President for Operations. Under his leadership, um, they pushed for the ISO 55001 certification of Headquarters facilities and making headquarters the first company to get certified for asset management in the Philippines. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lando Pacquiao uh, championed the digitization and integration of headquarters hydro power fleet. In November of last year, headquarters inaugurated its first ever regional control in Mindanao in Santa Cruz of Davao del Sur. The control center allows all nine plants 
okay, in southern Mindanao to be operated remotely in a single control room. He is not related to the senator and the boxer. Okay. Another resource speaker we have um, Mr. Carlos Lorenzo Vega. Okay. He is the head of Power Economics and Marketing Group of First Gen Corporation. They are responsible for performing and coordinating market and industry research and analysis to support strategic and business planning within the various departments and assist in business development, regulatory, and power marketing efforts for the geothermal, hydroelectric, and natural gas-fired power projects of first gen. VP okay. Vega obtained his master's in business administration as an ADBJSP scholar in the Asian Institute of Management, specializing in market research and quantitative analysis. He graduated cum laude but in Bachelor of Science in Economics, <coughs> excuse me, major in Development Economics from the University of the Philippines. Yeah. And he will be talking about the impact of COVID-19 to the first-gen corporation. And lastly, uh, to represent the president of Christopher Liu, Mr. Christopher Liu, the Chief Operating Officer of Lansan Power Corporation, we have Emerald A. Gabadilla, a registered electrical engineer, registered mechanical engineer, who is currently the Assistant Vice President for Operations of Lamsan Power Corporation. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the panelists, the discussants, and the resource speakers for session one this afternoon on generation. So I will now be turning over the floor to Mr. Enrique Gallardo, the primary discussant. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Raymond, for the kind introduction. And uh, we'll immediately embark on our very interesting topics. And uh, good afternoon to all and good afternoon to our dear panelists and dear presenters. And as mentioned, please bear with us. We appeal to your kind patience. Uh, let's present everything first, then we'll uh, do our best to get your comments and questions. And again, we appeal to your, your patience as we cannot really accommodate everything, but uh, be assured that uh, the team, all of us, uh, sincerely want to do follow-ups on a more long-term basis, working with localities, LGUs, agencies, TUs, and electric cooperatives. So on that note, without much ado, uh, I would now call on our uh, first presenter for the Mindanao Power Situation, uh, Director Nilo Hiroche of DUE Mindanao Field Office. Sir, you are now uh, live and the floor is yours. Hello, I'm going to get out. Hi, sir, Raymond. I am up and I've heard. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Madongo po yun? Yes, sir, Nilo. We can hear you very clearly. Okay. We can okay, hear you, sir, Nilo. Please go okay. ahead. You're live now. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Secretary Emmanuel uh, Pinyol of Minda, Chairperson of the City Manadera of ERC, uh, our very own. Yusik Emmanuel Vanessa, uh, Secretary Dilola, and Director Mariam Rasiden of the EPIMB, uh, Secretary Romeo Montenegro of Linda, our partners from the energy sector, local chief executives, honorable King congressmen in attendance, BARM officials, my other colleagues in DOE, and to all the distinguished participants of this forum, a pleasant afternoon for sa ating lahat. Before my presentation, I would like to express my congratulations to Minda for hosting this Mindanao Power Forum 2021. Also, I would like to thank Minda for giving us the opportunity to be part of this noble undertaking. Uh, some of the contents of my presentations were already highlighted in the message of Secretary Kusi as uh, read by our music. Uh, yes, Please allow me to proceed to my short presentation on the Mindanao demand supply situation as well as the status of plans and programs of the DOE in Mindanao area. So next slide, please. So this is the outline of my presentation. We will, I'll be discussing only two topics as presented. So next slide, please. Uh, this is 
this uh, present, uh, this slide uh, shows the situation of Mindanao in 2020 before the pandemic, uh, wherein it showed a noticeable growth in demand. The peak demand in January was noted at uh, 1,170 megawatts, which is uh, about 204 megawatts higher than uh, January 2019 peak demand, which is uh, recorded at uh, 1,774 megawatts only. By late March to May 15, Mindanao experienced a demand uh, reduction of about 20%. Basically, this is due to the declaration of enhanced community quarantines in most demand centers areas in the region. Uh, this scenario brought down the Mindanao demand in 2020 at its lowest with a noted demand of 1,390 megawatts, which uh, happened last May 3, 2020. Further, uh, starting last May 16 of 2020, the overall Mindanao demand still experienced a reduction of about 12%. Uh, and we noted that this uh, reduction was due to the declaration of general community quarantines and modified GCQ in most areas in Mindanao. The red line uh, in the graph represents the actual demands, while the dark blue area is the total available capacity of the Mindanao grid. In this presentation, it clearly shows that there is a surplus of power that has been noted in the Mindanao grid. Actually, this was also mentioned earlier by Yusuf, by our Yusuf Wanesa. Next slide, please. In this slide, with regards to capacity, the table, the table shows that the Mindanao uh, grid has an installed and dependable capacity of 4,584 megawatts and 4,031 megawatts, respectively. Now, please note that the largest share uh, comes from coal, accounting 49.4%. Next is hydro, 25.4%, uh, followed by oil based at 19.4%. Also, the geothermal uh, is uh, recorded at 2.4%, while the solar at 1.8% and biomass with 1.6% share of the pie. Next slide, please. Uh, based on the DOE's uh, statist power statistics as shown in this uh, table, the Mindanao electricity sales and consumption in 2020, which is about 77%, is almost at the same level as that uh, recorded in 2019 at 78.1. So, or just a 0.3 increase in 2020 versus the 2020, uh, 2019 sales. However, please note that if we compare the sectoral level in 2019 versus 2020, we can see that the Energy sales for commercial and industrial sectors have been reduced by 11.8 and 6.8 respectively. Uh, on the other hand, the residential sector increased by 12.6. So this is practically due to the closure of limited operations of the industries uh, during the implementation of the community quarantine for the commercial and industrial sector. While uh, for the residential, this is due also to the, in the increase was due also to the adaptation of online activities such as work from home scheme by both the government and private, private sectors, including the implementation of online or blended uh, online uh, classes in the education sector. Next slide, please. This slide shows us for this year uh, 2021, the Mindanao power demand has surpassed the 
projected peak demand of 2,098 megawatts, but uh, by only 0.4%. Comparing last year, the pandemic started, the peak demand has met our initial projection despite of the different quarantine classifications that were implemented in various key areas in the Mindanao area. Wherein, uh, during that time, we have recorded our system peak at 2,106 megawatts uh, last May 6, 2021, for, uh, for this month, no? at exactly 1.56 p.m. Uh, on the other hand, it, as emphasized earlier by our user Ponisa, the Mindanao st still has a sufficient supply capacity with an average gross reserve of 977 megawatts uh, based from January to May 19, 2021 record. Uh, on May 21, 2021 report of our Power Bureau, the Mindanao peak demand was recorded at 1,994 megawatts, while the Mindanao available capacity uh, recorded at 2,878 megawatts, or the Mindanao grid uh, has an excess capacity of 878 megawatts or about uh, or 31% above the peak demand. Next slide, please. This presentation, uh, as shown in this presentation, in the, uh, this presentation, despite of the not, noted rising demand, the Mindanao has more than enough reserves to accom accommodate power supply requirements of the grid. So therefore, uh, based from this data, no yellow and red alerts are expected to occur for this year, 2021. Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have uh, noted 31% uh, above peak demand as reported in uh, May 2021, 2021 by our API Next slide, please. As per 2018 to 2040 Philippine Energy Plan, Mindanao needs a total capacity addition of approximately 13,000 megawatts by 2040. This is uh, basically to address the, uh, and includes, among others, the government plans and programs uh, and promotion of renewables and flexible generation in the future. Presently, based on the table uh, on this slide, the coal still dominates the region in the energy and power mix. But in the future, we are looking forward to promote state-of-the-art technologies that will be aligned to our country's decarbonization and decentralization goals in the supply sector. Also in this table uh, uh, shows the summary of Mindanao power uh, projects in the pipeline as of December 2020, where in total of 352 megawatts committed power projects and 1,859 megawatts of indicative power projects for the entire Mindanao grid. The RE share or the renewable energy share for this uh, for the committed power project projects a project accounts only 20.2 percent, but RE has a significant share of 66.2 percent for the indicative power projects. Next slide, please. So allow me now to present the plans, uh, the updates on the plans and programs uh, in the energy sector for Mindanao. Next slide, please. So number one, we have the study option for Lasoreco and Mag Magelco in the new market environment. Uh, possible, uh, possible allocations of Agus output arrangements in line with the BOL provisions and clarify BARM government role in the rehabilitation of the leases. Uh, yesterday, the Department of Energy, led by our very own Yosef uh, 
Vanessa met with representatives from BARM, the LGO of Maguindanao, together with Pisam and Mia, and discussed further the issue of Magilco and solicited some recommendations, especially from the BARM and LGO concerned for the resolution of the race issue issues at hand. And we are expecting to uh, conduct more meetings with the BARM and the concerned local government units. Number two, we have the commercial operations of WISM. It was already mentioned earlier, uh, but allow me to, to reiterate uh, that this coming June 26 will be the target commercial date for the operation of the enhanced WISM design operations or EWPO. And also tomorrow, but beginning tomorrow, the LLDO or delimited light dispatch operations will, com will commence no? until uh, the day before the EWTO or June 25 of 2021. I understand that the IMOC is with us here today to provide us with more detailed updates about the recent Mindanao. So, Mamaya, of course, yeah, will be discussed in more further details. Policy for retail competition and open access. So hopefully, if the WISIM is already in place, the initial policy for implementation of this uh, ARCOA uh, is targeted to be uh, on the fourth quarter of 2021. Regarding the Agus Polangi Rehabilitation Project, uh, we have, the World Bank has already granted the amount of uh, 700,000 US dollars through the recipient executive trust fund, uh, which is intended to, pin, to jumpstart uh, for the financing of the project preparation. So specifically for the preparation of the project feasibility study and uh, tender documents. Number four, we have the relocation of the use facilities situated in governments right away. So our record shows that uh, 14,594 poles with estimated relocation cost of 895 million uh, are to be relocated for so on to the joint circular uh, number three, which provides the mechanism for uh, immediate relocation of electric poles within, within the national government's right of way and uh, providing timeline thereof. Now, there is an IITF that has been created under the JC number two, Meron Kitayo Katlong Joint Circulars with the DPWF. Um, uh, wherein this IITF uh, is to be composed of the DOE, DPWF, and NIA, wherein they are mandated, or this is mandated to conduct ocular inspection to monitor compliance. Uh, regarding the implementation of this program and to submit regular reports relative to uh, this matter. And then we have also the Mindanao Visayas Internet Connection Project. Uh, as a short background, due to the circum uh, circumstances brought about by COVID-19, the expected, expected time of completion of the project was moved from December 2020 to December 2020. So the project is a uh, is about uh, or a 30.85 percent completed as of December 31, 2020. Now uh, I suppose that the NGCP is also with us here today, who will be presenting later with some further details or highlights about the current project status of the Mindanao Visayas Interconnection project. Specifically, uh, they will be highlighting uh, its new target completion you know, because uh, we are going to, to revise the target completion of this uh, interconnection project due to the unexpected incident. Next slide, please. My last slide is about uh, the ER1-94 uh, program. The DOE had been expediting the release of ER1-94 funds 
which are DOE administered prior to the issuance of the DC 2018-08-0021. Starting from October 31, 2019, up to May 6 of 2021. The DOA have released already and remitted a total of 399.2 million to the host communities in various areas uh, in Mindanao that are hosting the power plants and other um, uh, beneficiaries. Also, in support to the combat against uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the DOE issued the partner circular number 2020-04-008, which suspended the implementation of regular ER-1 residential for uh, projects, uh, which allowed the utilization of the same uh, funds for COVID-19 response. Now, out of this uh, 399 million released, 358.5 million or 89.9% uh, was released for COVID-19 response. Uh, that ends my presentation. Again, my congratulations to Minda and thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Nilo for a very detailed presentation. And again, kindly hold, hold your questions. Uh, we're now documenting them, especially those in the chat box. Please keep them coming. Uh, Sir Nilo has touched a num uh, on a number of very important issues and I think our succeeding presenters will also touch on them. So kindly hold your horses and we'll now see the next presentation. And this will be led by Mr. Chola Bernard from uh, the National Renewable Energy Board. And he will share with us updates on the National Renewable Energy Program. Sir Chala, you are now live and the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm sorry, but we were not going to make a presentation for NREV because we do not have a specific uh, presentation for Mindanao. The uh, overall National Renewable Plan for 2021 to 2040 calls for a target of uh, uh, minimum of 35% uh, renewable in terms of energy no? uh, for uh, up to 2030 and then uh, and beyond. And this would be achieved in large part through the, uh, through the RPS. No? So, um, and how that's going to be done in a least cost manner um, would be, you know, we're in a uh, largely a competitive genera uh, generation sector. So uh, for the most part, then the, uh, the most cost efficient uh, renewable uh, energy technologies would be, uh, would be uh, well harnessed first. No? Um, but, you know, it, uh, it, again, I think there's, there's still some issues as to how this is going to be translated in practical terms, how the uh, uh, the RPS will be um, achieved or, or implemented, uh, considering that you know the DOE also has a program for a uh, renewable energy auction uh, program to allow smaller utilities, for example, even large utilities, uh, uh, to be able to use that uh, for procurement to comply with their RPS requirements. Um, okay, um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sir Cholo. But Sir Cholo is actually joining us as one of the panelists for this first yeah. session. Okay, so uh, Sir Enrique, we shall now proceed to, uh, uh, to the presentation by the Department of Energy. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, apologies for that, Sir Cholo. Uh, yes, uh, we now proceed to the next presentation on assessing the impact of COVID-19 on the energy supply and demand for, for the full year 2020 in the Philippines. And this will be led by the Department of Energy. Sir Mark, please take it away. 
Maayong hapon sa imong tanan. So my name is Selena K. Galeos from the Power Planning and Development Division of the Department of Energy. So again, on behalf of Secretary Alfonso G. Cusi, Under Secretary Emmanuel P. Wanessa, Assistant Secretary Redentor E. De Lola, Directors Mario C. Marasigan, Irma C. Exconde, and our last presenter, Nilo J. Heroche of MFO, I would like to thank you for welcoming us here today. So I am here to present the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Mindanao power sector. Next slide, please. So the presentation will be tackled into three parts. First is the 2020 Mindanao power situation. And then next is the challenges faced by the Mindanao power sector during the pandemic and generation, transmission, and distribution. And then third is the OE actions, plans, and programs transitioning to new normal. Let's start with the 2020 Mindanao power situation. Uh, this has already been comprehensively discussed by Director Nilo, so I'll just be quickly highlighting again several points and figures. So the actual peak demand here is represented by the red solid line. The peak demand for 2020 was 1,978 megawatts, which occurred in January 28. We initially projected the peak demand to occur in mid-May at 2,271 megawatts. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, you can see that it has caused a drop in demand, especially at the start of the implementation of the Enhanced Community Quarantine, or the ECQ. From first quarter to the second quarter, the average daily peak demand dropped by 3.4%. However, in the third quarter, you can see the daily peak demand start to build up, approaching the 2019 level, which in this figure is represented by the yellow solid line. The impact of COVID-19 and declaration of quarantines in terms of electricity demand in Mindanao is much less than that of the Luzon and Visayas Street, as a strict quarantine was relaxed earlier than in other economic areas in the country. Next slide, please. So at the start of the ECQ, there has been a significant decrease in electricity consumption, which is in parallel with a sudden drop in daily peak demand as presented in the previous slide. So for the year 2020, the months of April and May as shown, displayed the lowest electricity consumption, whereas historical data has shown that these summer months, which we refer to as the peak quarter, is the period when the yearly peak demand often occurs, and these months usually contribute the largest electricity consumption as well. So the figure also gives us an overview of the impact of COVID-19 and the change of electricity consumption patterns. The residential sector grew a notch higher at the start of the pandemic. So from around a 40% share in March, it grew to 48% in April and May. And then in the months of GCQ and MGCQ, or the more lenient levels of community quarantine, the average is around 43%, which is still, still higher than the pre-pandemic period. Now, if residential increase at the start of the enhanced community quarantine, the industrial sector plummeted from 39.4% in March to only 33% in April and May. That's about a 6% decrease in consumption share. However, come June, the consumption share rose again to about 13.5% and then maintained this momentum for the rest of the year. The commercial sector also decreased from a 15% consumption share pre-pandemic to around 12.8% during ECQ and then averaging around 13.5% during GCQ and GCQ. Next slide, please. So the following table shows a comparison of electricity sales cons and consumption of 2019 pre-pandemic and 2020 pandemic year. So unsurprisingly, the community quarantine restrictions put in place boosted an annual growth of 12.6% in the residential sector. On the other hand, with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the remaining sectors, in particular commercial, industrial, and others not elsewhere classified, posted a year-on-year -year contraction by the end of 2020. Next, please. So despite a slowdown in operations due to the pandemic, as will be discussed later on in the presentation, the Mindanao Green has adequate capacity to meet its demand. So around 30% of the capacity mix comes from renewables, while coal still remains to be the top source of energy, taking up about half of the grid's capacity mix. Next slide, please. Similarly, even at the height of the pandemic, coal-fired power plants continue to have the highest share, even increasing from last year of about 72% of Mindanao's energy generation, while renewable energy contributed around 26% in the generation mix. 
uh, last year, in October 2020, the DOE also implemented a moratorium on endorsements for greenfield coal-fired power projects. So together with the renewable portfolio standards and the other policies put in place, uh, we are very hopeful that we will still be able to meet at least 35% RE share in the power generation mix by 2030. Next, please. Okay, so now we move on to challenges faced by the Mindanao power sector during the pandemic and generation, transmission, and distribution. Next, please. So these are com the common issues and concerns we encountered due to the imposition of community quarantine restrictions. First is limited local manpower, which is due to the limited movement of the people. So for example, workers going to and from the plant site. So we've received requests from companies like Sarangani Energy Corporation, FDC Misamis, and Stayag, if you're here, um, hello. Among others, for assistance for their employees to be able to mobilize and support their ongoing operations during the pandemic. So this is also actually related to the second bullet, which is um, delivery of equipment necessary parts um, being manufactured locally or internationally. So a form of assistance we have provided is we've issued IATF IDs to show that they are part of the essential workforce under the IATF guidelines. So next is limited foreign technical experts and personnel due to limited flight accommodations and travel restrictions to foreign nationals entering the country. So GN Power, for example, requested assistance in the entry of their foreign personnel, and the DOE facilitated the endorsement of their requests to appropriate agencies like uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Bureau of Quarantine. And also, uh, restrictions on, restrictions on cross-border personnel entry due to LGU-issued guidelines of the province, municipality, and city. So again, this has been a concern as well because again, the restrictions are there to limit the movement of the people to prevent local transmission. So these issues and concerns collectively cause a domino effect resulting in challenges specific to generation, transmission, and distribution. Next slide, please. So for generation, the resulting challenges were delays in preventive maintenance of the generating facilities and delays in the construction of generation projects. Now, while there have been some delays in the construction and on-time completion of power projects, it is not a pressing concern for now as Mindanao currently has more than enough supply reserves to meet the demand with or without the impact of the pandemic. Nonetheless, we are continuously monitoring the status of these power projects in anticipation of the completion of the transmission interconnection projects so that the Mindanao grid will be able to share additional capacity to Visayas and consequently to Luzon, especially as we are approaching the post-pandemic demand rebound. Next, please. Similar situation in transmission. Uh, those issues and concerns brought about delays in preventive maintenance and construction of transmission facilities. So the next slide, um, the following are some of the transmission projects affected by the pandemic. So first is the Mindanao Visayas Interconnection Project or the MVIP initially adjusted its timeline from December 2020 to December 2021 in consideration of the challenges encountered at the height of the pandemic. However, the MVIP will extend beyond its adjusted December 2021 target completion due to the damage in several portions of its fiber optic cable connection or submarine cables. As for the Mindanao 230 kilovolt uh, transmission backbone project, uh, while there has been delays from the original target date of completion, the project has since been completed last December 2020 and is now energized. Next, please. So the delays in construction in power project of power projects also resulted in the delay in the delays in the commencement of PSA with distribution utilities. And then in terms of the competitive selection process or the CSP, majority of CSP activities of DUs targeted to be completed in 2020 were also delayed due to community quarantine restrictions that prevented face-to-face -face meetings, um, limited capacity on venues, and, uh, and of course the travel restrictions. So as an alternative, some DUs resorted to adopt online platforms to conduct their uh, CSP activities virtually. The DOE likewise advised other DUs to also adopt the same method in order to complete their scheduled CSPs. Next, please. So there were delays in inspection of facilities, just like in generation and transmission. And another challenge that we face in distribution is the suspension of substation and meter reading operations. 
In line with the COVID-19 pandemic, the DOE also decided to extend the submission date of the distribution development plan. So in addition to the extension, we requested the DUs to submit a normalized forecast and a forecast with COVID impact consideration. We also requested documents showing that the DU invoked the force majeure provision in the power supply agreements due to COVID-19 community quarantine restrictions. And just an update on this, uh, most of the Mindanao's, Mindanao DUs have already submitted their initial 2020 to 2029 BDP and have been reviewed by the DOE. So to date, um, 23 out of 40 DDP submissions of Mindanao DUs have been accepted as final and have been posted in the DOE eBase portal. Next slide, please. So for delays in um, electri electrification project due to the pandemic, it's mostly due to the reallocation of funds, such as unused subsidies and the electrification fund under ER1-94 to support COVID-19 related programs. Another challenge was for completed projects, technical on-site inspections were limited, thus delaying liquidation and fund releases to succeeding projects. As such, NEA and DOE would still have to establish new guidelines on the inspection activities. Next, please. So this is the last part, DOE actions, plans, and programs transitioning to the new normal. So DOE actions to ensure continuous power services. The DOE issued advisories in ensuring the unimpeded delivery of energy services. We also issued IETF IDs to frontline power industry personnel to assist the companies in the mobilization of their employees as a way to address the issues and concerns mentioned before. The DOE also processed uh, endorsement to allow the entry of foreign experts and consultants with critical roles in power sector operations. The DOE issued an advisory to all power generation companies and distribution utilities to ensure reliable and stable power supply during the government's COVID-19 vaccine rollout program. Also, as an added assistance or contribution in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, the DOE has approved the department circular rationalizing the utilization of ER1-94 funds by host local government units in response to COVID-19 public health emergency. For consumers, the DOE also issued an advisory providing grace period to all, to all electricity bills falling during the community quarantine and implemented a no disconnection policy for lifeline customers. And lastly, the COVID-19 response protocol for the energy sector. Next, please. As for DOE's new normal measures, we are closely coordinating and monitoring with um, with stakeholders and agencies to ensure energy security throughout the quarantine transition phase, our entry to the new normal and even into the post-COVID-19 future, and then resumption of suspended and delayed energy projects as well as energy exploration and development activities, highlighting the importance of energy resiliency, which allows the energy industry to quickly adapt to COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 related developments. Um, ensuring the energy sector's preparedness in anticipation of the uptick in demand as our economy starts to rebound. Next, please. Other new normal measures, having the entire industry on deck to help attain all our energy requirements. Harmonizing work as well as health and safety protocols across all energy sector industries. On power interruption, the DOE has already established the monitoring of operation of generating, transmission, and distribution facilities, especially in times of outage. So in cases of power interruption, DOE immediately coordinates with the concerned stakeholders to gather information on the cause of interruption and estimated resumption of operation. And if needed, DOE can provide assistance to the affected stakeholders to expedite the repair, the repair of facilities in order to provide the needed electricity to the end users. So as mentioned, if there are other issues and concerns raised to the department, the DOE is always here to help or to give further assistance as needed. And as a way forward, the Department of Energy, along with its partner stakeholders, will ensure continuous uh, power supply delivery by continuing to monitor and address the challenges of the entire power industry sector in terms of the operation and development of facilities during the ongoing pandemic situation and in anticipation of the post-pandemic recovery. So I think this is my last slide. Um, daghang salamat kaayo and please stay safe. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Selena. Uh, if only you can hear our applause right now, but maybe someday later. 
And uh, now we've seen the, the broader strokes of things, uh, looking a bit at the macro and all uh, practical, all, all our concerns. Now we'll soon uh, deep dive into the specific experiences of your dear partners in the generation side. We'll have Headcore, First Gen, APC, and then Lamsan. And again, uh, we're capturing all your questions. And just to, to cite a few, we have some concerns on the shift in demand, the reduction, and the interplay of coal with the hydro. We're looking at concerns as well on actual implementation of plans and programs, access, you know, underserved areas, uh, things on ARCO as well as on RPS. So hold your horses again. And uh, we now go to our next presenter. May I now call on our presenter for head core, Mr. Rolando Pacquiao, uh, VP for OMM. Sir, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, Loud sir. Okay, uh, thank you for having me for this year's Mindanao Power Forum to shed light on the topic of building secure and sustainable energy future for Mindanao. I personally believe that this is a matter that should be discussed now more than ever. Many are now moving to the digital space and as energy providers, we must be able to provide the growing energy needs of today without um, compromising the needs of the future. To begin with, allow me to introduce our organization. Headcore, our business units, operates under the Aboitis Power Corporation. AP is the holding company for the Aboitis Group's investment in uh, power generation distribution, and retail electricity services. The company is one of the largest power producers in the Philippines with a balanced portfolio of assets located across the country. It is a major producer of clean energy, a Boitis power brand for clean and renewable energy. On your screen is a map showing the various locations of a Boitis power's generation distribution facilities in Mindanao. So AP is currently has a facilities spread across six regions in um, Mindanao. You know, the next slide, uh, we have also listed down all of Aboitis Power customers in Mindanao, some of which include uh, Double Light and Power Company and uh, Cotabato Light and Power Company. Now, as earlier mentioned, um, AP has been a major producer of uh, clean energy, and one of the business units that pioneered renewable energy generation in the group is Headcorp. From operating the Talomo Hydros here in Davao City in the year 1978, Headcorp grew to operate 22 hydro facilities as of uh, 2021. Headcorp um, specializes in run of river hydro operations. As shown on your screen, um, this illustrates the typical run of river scheme. As compared to other generating facilities, a small hydro plant has a similar foot, has a smaller footprint, which is why its operations have a minimal to no effect on the environment and can be used, utilized in, a, in a remote areas. The headquarters group has 20 to clean energy facilities. Its uh, latest addition in Mindanao is the Manolo Fortich Hydro 1 and 2 in Bukidnon, which began commercial operations last July and November 2018, um, respectively. Now. So more than just growing our fleet, uh, we also ensure to improve the reliability of our operations. One of, one of which is through plant automation. With the plants automated, there, they are now, there are now systems in place that improve operational efficiency, enhance safety by minimizing the interaction between the plant operators and machines and enable real-time monitoring. Aside from automation, we're also working towards integration. We aim to centralize real-time data monitoring and alarms management so that plant performance is better tracked 
and outages are better analyzed and controlled. And just last year, November 2022, we saw the completion of our first ever regional control center here in Southern Mindanao. The control center located in Santa Cruz, Davao de Lisur, connects headquarters five hydro facilities in Davao City and four hydro facilities in Davao de Lisur, along with all nine plants in Southern Mindanao to be operated remotely in a single uh, control room. Currently, we're working on automation of our legacy plants in Luzon and integration of our Manolo Fortich hydros to the regional um, control center. With our efforts to improve and um, innovate our processes and assets, uh, Headquarter Group was able to record 957 gigawatt hour generation in 2020 with 528 gigawatt hour generation from Mindanao um, plants. The Mindanao plants alone, uh, alone were able to power around 220,000 household year round amid the ongoing uh, pandemic. Headcore also recorded its lowest um, weighted and planned out its factor of 0.73% uh, for 2020. It's actually the best year record for the past uh, five years. This emphasizes the steady improvement of headquarters um, plant reliability as it recorded the lowest number of unexpected shutdown of its hydro facility units. Keep, keeping up the positive momentum for 2021, um, headquarters logged a total generation of 182 gigawatt hour for the first quarter of 2021, breaking its own forecast of 120. 3 gigawatt hour for the covered period. This is a result driven by favorable weather condition this year and improved plant um, reliability. We look forward to hitting and exceeding our targets for the coming months as well as our Mindanao plants are forecasted to generate 527 gigawatt hour for this year. In uh, headquarters, we are also proud to positively contribute clean and renewable energy to the country. However, in staying true to our promise of advancing business and uh, communities, our mission doesn't stop at energy generation alone. We also ensure that we give back to our partner communities who are vital to the success of the organization. Headcore has since turned over 103 million worth of corporate social responsibility activities, specifically to Mindanao. These projects are primarily focused on education, enterprise development, environment, and other special projects. For this year alone, Headcore is set to turn over 7.3 million worth of CSR projects to our host communities in Davao City. Babo de Sur and Bukidnon. Last year, to be specific, uh, we made sure to supply the immediate needs of our host communities, frontliners in Binanao, amounting to almost 1 million pesos. Assistance includes sacks of rice, ready to eat goods, and personal protective equipment, among others. Um, on top of the CSR projects, uh, Headcore also adheres to the Energy Regulation um, 1-94, a policy under the Department of Energy Act of 1992, which stipulates that host communities will get a share of one centavo for every kilowatt hour generated by power plants op operating in its area. A total of 24 24.2 million funds have since been remitted to communities and local government units in Mindanao. Such shares can be um, utilized for uh, electrification, development, livelihood programs, and uh, reforestation, among others. Some big, some big tickets project funded by ER1-94 funds are the 32 million infra project focusing on uh, completing of farm-to-market roads in Balangay, Sibulan, in Santa Cruz, and a 10, 10 uh, million electrification project from Barangay, Capatagan, Digo City, to Sitio, Todaya, Santa Cruz, in the uh, Sur. 
Lastly, um, we in Headcourt take pride in our environmental uh, initiatives. In the previous years, natural phenomena like El Nino negatively impacted our generation. As we strive to mitigate this risk in the best and most responsible way possible, but more than just being a strategic move, our environmental uh, initiatives are a fulfillment of our values as renewable energy company. Championing environmental initiative has been ahead for second nature. As a group, we have since planted 3 million trees, of which 1.4 million trees were reforested in Mindanao. Through the help of reforestation partners, um, Headcore is also set to plant 45,000 trees this year in Davao, Davao del Sur, and Bukidnon. In addition to uh, reforestation, Headcore also has the initiative on Eco Market Day, River Clean Up, and Water Management. So that's how we do uh, what we do. Headcore and the Boitis Group in general looks into fulfilling its um, sustainability framework. And that is making the right long term decisions that balance the interests of people, planet, and profit. And so we look forward to uh, contributing further to the energy landscape in Mindanao and in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Lando. Uh, it was very heartening to hear uh, your sharing, your presentation, all those innovations and initiatives. Uh, from a broad range of things, from automation of plants to CSR host communities, uh, serving the frontliners, helping them out, and reforestation, and on a larger scale, really helping the environment recover and strengthen. So thank you, and we'll get back to you later for comments and questions. And, okay, uh, Sir Enrique, I would just like to remind our presenters to, as yeah. much as possible, try to keep their presenter uh, presentations within 10 minutes. Okay, and also I would just like to clarify that Mr. Cholo Bernard of the National Renewable Energy Board is part of our panelists. Thank you for that. Thank you for the clarification, Raymond. So we proceed. Our next speaker is, there, is Mr. Carlos Lorenzo Vega, VP for uh, and Head for Power Economics and Marketing Group of First Gen Corporation. Yes, uh, sir, please uh, go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Enrique. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen already? Yes, it's clear. And we can hear you well. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mayong uh, hapon. Thank you very much. And I'd like to greet uh, everybody on this call, on this webinar. A pleasant afternoon. Uh, all the ladies and gentlemen um, participating, the stakeholders in our power industry, of course, our leaders uh, from DOE, the hard-working uh, and dedicated uh, members of DOE and ERC uh, for DOE, led by uh, Secretary Kusi, USEC uh, Emmanuel uh, Juanesa, of course, our ASEC uh, Redentor De Lola. And uh, of course, uh, from, from ERC, we have uh, Director Sharon and uh, okay. under the leadership of Chairperson Agnes de Venedera. Pleasant good afternoon to you. And of course, congratulations and uh, thank you for having me to uh, for the to the organizers, uh, led by Secretary Emmanuel Pinol and uh, ASEC Re Romeo Montenegro. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, just to jump right into it, uh, given the time uh, allocation, we've uh, tried to limit our slides. Uh, we've prepared nine made slides, uh, really focusing on uh, the topic that is to build a secure and sustainable energy future for Mindanao, but more particularly to share our lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, this is usually a slide that we show um, uh, during our presentations, but I guess that's not the point of this slide for today. This is really just a slide to show you that the lessons learned that we will be sharing will actually be more from our Luzon and Visayas plants. We only have actually two plants today in Mindanao, 1.6 megawatts of Agusan uh, in uh, hydro, um, first gen Bukidnon, and 100 megawatts of Mount Apo geothermal, which is selling its output today to, to uh, PISAM um, and NPC. So I think uh, if you permit me, uh, I will not go into too much detail uh, in, in the various, maybe we can capture the, the details later in the Q&A. 
but permit me to go through this presentation to stressing just three main points uh, on the lessons learned from COVID. And, and the lessons learned that we wanted to share was really to focus on, again, if we were looking at uh, a sustainable energy future for Mindanao, the question is, given the pandemic, how do we keep the lights on? And I think um, I wanted to say that the first sharing or the first component of our sharing would be the first would be on our power plant. So essentially, what happened was for us to keep our for us to keep the lights on, we of course needed to prepare for continuous and reliable operations. And as you will as you well all know, um, when 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 the pandemic hit, uh, the whole world changed as well as the way we work including the plants, uh, including the workers in our plants. And so we had to prepare by improving our health protocols, changing and adjusting our work arrangements. We had to institute a shelter in place program wherein so that uh, we minimize the recording stopped. Infections. Uh, we needed to ensure that everybody is uh, safe and is uh, far from getting infected from people out, coming in and out. Recording so in progress. An, so this is just an illustration of what we did. This is a, a picture of our first gen clean energy, pro, uh, clean energy complex in Batangas. And as you well know, these are the uh, natural gas fired plants. Um, that, uh, of course, the challenge is that uh, we didn't know that this was happening. We had maintenance schedules for the year, and we had to adjust immediately because there were particularly for the plant maintenance schedules, it was a challenge for, for foreign workers coming in doing the maintenance work. And so we had to coordinate closely with government agencies in order to keep everything, everybody safe, everybody protected, but at the same time, we had to keep the show going or we had to keep the, the plant and maintenance schedules uh, uh, to minimize disruption. Now, when we say uh, what were the measures that we had to in place, we had to strictly enforce or adjust the way we, we do work. We had to incorporate work bubbles. And, you know, just to share, when we were doing this, when we were preparing for this, the first question for, uh, of, of senior management from us was who or which group is the weakest link? Who goes out? of, of uh, the site, who, who has the highest probability of getting infected because they have the most number of interactions. And, and, and you can imagine that even our security uh, team had to, to uh, develop their own work bubble and to, to adjust the work processes so that we minimize disruption. And of course, outside of the measures, we had to implement or put in additional uh, tools, so to speak, to help us manage uh, the health and the security of our employees, such as we had to invest in um, improving air, indoor air quality. We had to make sure that uh, disinfection and sanitation stations were all over the place. And, and, and that, again, we had to ask ourselves, where is the weakest link? And, and by answering that question, we, had to, we were able to address um, our work arrangements and adjust our work arrangements. Okay, so now, I'm still on the power plants. These are just uh, pictures, but these are pictures from a different power plant. These are from our hydro power plants. And as you can see, social distancing and, you know, uh, it, it just it just pays off when, when, you, when you change and ensure, you, you know, you take the extra step to ensure that everybody is uh, minimizing or uh, lessening the probability of getting infected. Okay, of course... Having said that, it was also important for us, uh, it's important to see that there's a picture. It was important for us um, in terms of employee welfare that when they are shelter in place, of course, they, they do not, uh, their, their mental health is, uh, is also considered because they have to, they have, they're, they're human beings. And when they are shelter in place, they, they cannot feel like prisoners. And so we had to ensure that these things are also provided for. For our, uh, for our employees at the site or for our employees in the power plants. Now, the last part of what we wanted to share on the different things that we had to do for our power plants was, of course, as I've said, the, the show must go on. And because we're running power plants, we know that it is very vital that we follow or maintain our power plants properly. And 
on a timely manner. Now, given, given what happened, we, we recognize the fact that there were challenges logistically and there will be challenges in, in implementing this. So what did we do? We had to revisit and sit down, look at how we used to or how we scheduled the maintenance. And this is a picture of how we did it for our portfolio because having a portfolio helps us, again, keep the lights on ensuring that we don't maintain air, all our units at once. And if you can see these, um, uh, how should I say, these squares or blocks represent the time uh, that they were out. And so from two, three uh, week outages for several units at the same time, we had to rejigger it and revisit how can we maintain them, but at the same time manage the, the fact that we don't want to take out uh, capacity from the grid all at the same time. So you can see that we did small, bite-sized, socially distant uh, maintenance schedules in our different geothermal units. And, and we continue to do this. And to date, I think the last time I was in the office was uh, the first week of March. And we are all uh, still on SIP for the ones in the plant. And we are still on work from home arrangement today. And we're just waiting for this last part on the right side of the slide for our vac vac to normal, our vaccination program to be fully implemented so that we will be able to move forward uh, and, and progress. So the, the other part, so this is, that's the first part, the power plants we had to do and, and uh, those are the sharings on our lessons learned from our power plants. The other, the other, I think, insight that we got from our pandemic or from our COVID-19 experience was that it's not enough for the power plants to be uh, functioning properly because the power plants, for them to fun function properly, would need other support groups to function seamlessly and properly. And uh, while I understand uh, WESM is not yet part of or is not yet commercially operational in Mindanao, I'm, I'm sure it will soon um, be in commercial operations. But in terms of Luzon and Visayas, where WESM was already operating, we know for a fact that all power plants and everything when WESM is operating, everything goes through it. it it's, it's the pool and it's the market that we participate in and the power plants cannot perform or cannot operate in isolation. We had to adjust all the other support groups, including uh, our, our WESM trading operations. And, and what we did was we had to ensure, uh, we had to input or put in place, sorry, put in place uh, contingencies, I would say contingencies in the, in the, in the sense that we had to separate the the trading offices and create secondary offices and create shelter in place protocols for them so that if one trader or one trading office is infected then we ensure that the others can still continue the work um, luckily we were none of our traders have been uh, not have been infected and and I think it's been very helpful that we we did this now outside of changing the way we did the trading operation. This is 24 by seven, of course, uh, just like the power plants. Uh, the other thing that we had to put in place was to improve or strengthen our remote, remote work capabilities. And we had to move towards digital tools, as you can see on the right side of, this, of the screen. So now we, are, uh, we have physical contingencies in terms of our offices, but at the same time, we have contingency in terms of strengthening our remote work capabilities. Now, lastly, and of course, not but not the least, I think the third insight that we wanted to share was that for the for us to keep the lights on, it is not all but it's not all about the technical side of things. It's not about the operations. It's also about the full circle of the way we operate in this industry. And I'm talking about how we managed or helped our customers. So as you can see, almost all of our customers were impacted either through lower demand, as uh, uh, our, our, our lady from DOE mentioned earlier, demand was lowered. And so the DUs and ECs, and of course, even the retail customers had problems with their contracts. They, they had problems paying because uh, for some customers, they weren't able to collect. And even our, our contract with uh, our customer PISAM for Mindanao 1 and 2, and even for our Unified LaTeX uh, Power plants that uh, they, they were they were they were getting 
hampered or Pisam was not able to pay uh, normally. And so what did we do? We actually wanted to, sorry, we wanted to help them in all the ways we can financially. So we try to help them by not being too strict on, on their payments. They, we, we allow them to extend their payments and stagger them even beyond what was prescribed by the DOE and ERC because really some of them had a hard time. And why do I say this? Some of our customers, um, uh, even the particularly the electric cooperatives, were serving tourist-based economies or tourist-based areas. And, and as you can imagine, tourism uh, dropped like, uh, like anything. No? Uh, it dropped significantly, affecting the, the economy of, of, of that particular EC. And so we, we had to extend more and longer uh, uh, provisions for them to get back on their feet. To, to be honest, to date, there are, there are still some who are, have not yet paid fully, and we have not invoked any interest on that. Uh, on that claim, and we continue to help them with other things. And that's my next slide. I think when we looked at helping our customers, we thought it's not just about helping them in their payments and collection. It was also helping them cope with the pandemic in the way they operate. And so what did we do? We tried to um, uh, conduct virtually uh, business continuity modules, and, and, and it, it it's very it's very heartwarming for us to hear that our customers would say, you know, we were not prepared for the pandemic. We were not prepared for the lockdown, and it's just so. Th then they were just so thankful that we were able to help them put in place BCM uh, protocols, business continuity protocols, and and help them really uh, walk them through how to manage their 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 business, so to speak, of 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 providing electricity service to their member consumers. On the other side, of course, we didn't stop there. What we wanted to do was to really think through what are their needs. And, you know, some of the customers actually, um, well, they were quite shy when they said, you know, we wanted to participate, but we actually don't know how to do video conferencing. And so what we came up with, what was, uh, with was different tools for them to uh, adjust such as uh, things like video conferencing 101. We tried to help them and teach them. We put together some modules and even uh, did dry runs for them how to and even help them uh, install these apps. Small things like this were very helpful for them. And, and, and uh, I think overall, this adds to the concept of being regenerative and in fact, the sustainable practice, meaning to say helping them uh, complete that whole virtuous cycle. And so uh, I think we build, uh, I think having a collaborative and co cooperative approach will continue and will help us not just the power generation side but also the whole industry to keep the lights on. And so these were all of the efforts we did with our customers. And as I've said, it it wasn't just about giving discounts. It it wasn't just about ex uh, being lenient and being flexible with the way they paid. It was also providing them, based on our discussion with them, what they needed. For, for them to cope with the pandemic. Of course, in sum, uh, as my ending sum, I hope I didn't uh, take too much time. Uh, we have four main points. We would have to prepare for continuous reliability, uh, re continuous and reliable operations. Again, uh, just to share what we wanted to do was look at it from a perspective, from a mindset that the pandemic is not going away soon. And we had to have we had to think long term and institutionalize changes in the way we do work, um, having that perspective. And so that in included uh, SIP work from home. We also had to ensure that we plan our maintenance uh, schedules properly and and manage the portfolio, have um, build on the strength of having a portfolio there, uh, and of course uh, having support groups um, strengthening their remote work. Uh, capabilities and automation so that they too will be able to work seamlessly with the power plants. And on the other side, of course, just to complete that cycle or that, that whole loop, we wanted to share that, you know, we, we, full, we really believe that keeping the lights on will mean taking care of your customers and understanding their needs to cope during the pandemic. So, dagang salamat. Let's create a climate of change. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, back to you, uh, Enrique.
Thank you, Sir Carlo. Similarly, if only can hear our applause now. And yeah, I take away what you ask. Where is the weakest link? I think a very fundamental question of the many things we need to do. And I think it speaks of uh, resilience uh, in its very core. And you also said we have to look at this long term. So we have la our last two presentations. Uh, thank you, Sir Carlo, again. And our last two presentations are coming up soon. And uh, for uh, the Agus Palang Hydropower Complex, let us all welcome Mr. Edmundo Veloso Jr., the VP of National Power Corporation. Sir, you are now live. Take it away. Thank you, sir. And good afternoon to everyone, to our government officials, uh, DOE led by USEC Mani Wanesa, ASEC Red, Delola, Director Mario Marsigan, all other government officials, and all the participants of this uh, Minnow Power Forum. Good afternoon, my hapon. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, we would like to thank Minda for giving us the opportunity to share the updates on the Argus Polangi Rehabilitation Project. As you all know, uh, NPC still continues to manage and operate the Argus Polangi plant owned by PISAM. Uh, it's one of the re remaining mandates of NPC. Now, the government has decided to do the rehab rehabilitation of the Argus Polangi plants. First is to, with the two objectives of first, uh, putting back the uh, capability, the, uh, the stalled capacity of the Argus Palangi plants, which uh, is, is a combined total of 1,001 megawatts. And second is to prolong the life of these assets, generating assets. Now, to give us the presentation, I would like to request our Focal person for the Agus Polangi Rehabilitation Project, uh, Mr. Ray Polisico, is also the manager from the Office of the Vice President, Binanao Generation. Thank you, sir. Ray. Uh, thank you, Sir Bong. And to Honorable uh, Secretary Emmanuel Pignol, uh, to the Honorable Chairperson Agnes de Vanadera, our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, Yusek uh, Emmanuel Juaneza. Engineer Ronald Abad, Mr. Cholo Bernard, and also to our discussant, uh, Mr. Enrique Gallardo, to our fellow presenters, guests, and participants, good afternoon. Uh, in behalf of our Vice President, Sir uh, Edmond Veloso Jr., please allow me to present the NPC Mindanao Generation presentation on the Agus uh, Palangi Rehabilitation Project and the impact of COVID-19 to the plant's uh, operation. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, to start with, the Agus Pulang Hydro Power Plants is composed of seven hydroelectric power plants with a total of 1,000.1 megawatts, where most of these plants are run of river type. These plants are located in the regions of Barm and Region 10, that is, uh, Lano del Sur, Lano del Norte, and Bukidnon provinces. These plant assets are also owned by PISAM and operated by NPC as per, as per ITERA law. Also, the hydropower plants cater PISAM's power customers while also uh, providing ancillary services to the Mindanao grid. Next slide, please. So this is the location maps, which you can find at your left is the series or, or the cascade of power plants from the Lake Lanao. Uh, at Marawi City, traversing the Baloy floodplains and down to Iligan City. And in the right side, you can find the Polangi 4 uh, plant located in Maramag, Bukidnon, and also shown is the location where the Agus plants are located. Uh, this is just to show and give you an idea on the proximities of the plants. Next slide, please. So the proposed uh, Agus Polangi Hydropower Plants Rehabilitation Project, or the APRP, the project is the rehabilitation of Agus 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, and Polangi 4 uh, hydroelectric power plants. Uh, the project involves 18 generating units with a, a total of 932.1 megawatts. We wish to note that uh, the Agus 6 units 1 and 2 are not included in this project since the units were recently updated and rehabilitated from 25 to 34.5 megawatts each 
and were completed, commissioned uh, sometime in 2018. The project development objective, as also defined by World Bank, is to restore the capacity of the genera generation units increase the availability of clean electricity and strengthen the safety of the dams. Uh, the indicators of these uh, objectives are uh, extended operational lives, which is at least uh, 30 years or more, restored uh, rated capacity, improve safety and enhance reliability and strengthen resilience against climate change and natural disasters. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, the scope of the project includes uh, the rehabilitation of electrical and mechanical components of generating units and its auxiliaries, and also addressing of uh, obsolescence issues and updating of operational performance and conditions with the installation of state-of-the-art um, monitoring, instrumentation and control, protection and dispatch uh, systems. Uh, this also includes uh, addressing some civil works, uh, uh, the pen stocks, and other plant specific issues. However, uh, we would like to note that uh, it is the feasibility study that will be determine the final scope of work of the project. The project impact, as uh, envisioned, are the following uh, increased reliability and efficiency of plants' operation. Uh, this is to cope up with the changing dynamics in the main grid while uh, providing energy and ancillary services. Balance energy cost in Mindanao grid. Uh, this is to impact, uh, benefit the electricity consumers in Mindanao and reduce dependency on fossil fuel. Next slide, please. The project cost, uh, it is around or approximately uh, estimated, estimated between uh, 12.5 to 20 billion uh, pesos. And the final estimate will be based on the result of the feasibility study. Source of funding uh, is through the official uh, development assistance or the ODA. Uh, World Bank has uh, initiated a multilateral uh, funding source with uh, several uh, partners. The project timeline, uh, it is approximately slated to 41 months, or that is uh, three years and five months from the uh, mobilization, and to the last uh, commissioned unit. Uh, this is init initially based on the study of World Bank. However, the estimated schedule may vary, uh, subject to the result of the feasibility study. Next slide, please. The updates on uh, project pre preparatory activities as of April uh, 30, 2021, for the feasibility study, uh, a preparatory study, the multiple option study, which is conducted by the World Bank, is nearly completed. And we would like to note that this study will also be uh, inputs for the FS. There's also a World Bank uh, rec recipient executed uh, trust fund grant to finance the uh, FS and the owner's engineer in the tendering and procurement uh, for the project, which is uh, already approved by the bank uh, management. And we are also waiting the, uh, the issuance of the special presidential authority for the grant. Preparation of terms of reference for the hiring of experts or the consultants to assist uh, in PC in the FS preparation is also ongoing. For the environmental and social impact assessment, the ESIA, the contractor, uh, the tractor that has already conducted and completed uh, 48 uh, information, education, and communication campaigns for Agus and Polangi plants areas and target communities. So this is uh, funded by the EU. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. For the project uh, approval uh, process uh, in regard to the one, uh, one of the requirements for the ICC NEDA approval, uh, NPC already received the directive to submit project description report from NEDA. This is in relation to NPC's request for ECC amendment for the project. 
For the project appraisal by World Bank, the bank uh, conducted a virtual uh, preparation mission for the project last February 8 to, uh, to 15, uh, 2021. Uh, World Bank also initiate, initiated the kickoff meeting for the Rapid Gender Assessment or the RGA last April 21, 2021. Also, the procurement uh, capacity assessment for NTC is, is ongoing and a second virtual preparation mission, the pre-appraisal of the project is scheduled on May 28, 2021, uh, which just has uh, started uh, yesterday. Okay, so going to the uh, COVID-19 uh, condition, uh, the effect of the pandemic uh, is really being felt with no exception to the operations of the Agus Polangi plants. And the notable effect is in 2020, the combined Agus Polangi plants actual generation was reduced by 33% as compared to the average generation for the last five years due to the low demand. Uh, this is the lowest annual generation being recorded as per uh, available data. There is also a significant increase in the amount and frequency of spillages in effect of the low generation. At the same time, we are able to maintain elevation at Lake Lanao at a significant level. So the impact uh, is the reduced and recalibrated generation forecast for the next three years. Next slide, please. So the challenges during uh, this COVID-19 uh, condition, uh, one of our challenges is on how to maintain significant share of generation in the Mindanao grid amidst the low demand. Uh, way forward, uh, much we can do is to ensure the availability of Agus Polani plants uh, generating units. So by the time the demand picks up, our units will be readily available to serve the requirements. Second is on how to minimize spillages and maintain adequate water resources or significant level of elevation of Lake Lanao. Uh, way forward, we need to strengthen our capability in the optimization of resources and also to reiterate the position in prioritizing the Agus Polang hydropower plants in this uh, protocol and to ensure readiness during the WESM uh, implementation. And with that, uh, that is the last slide. Dagan salamat, maayong hapon sa Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Ray and Sir Edmond. Very, very detailed update. I think a lot uh, of our participants are very interested on in those updates and whether or not it will push through soon enough. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the updates. And we move on to our final presenter. And please bear with us. We'll soon be done and we'll have our discussions. For Lamsan Power Corporation, uh, we now uh, listen to Emerald Capatilia, Assistant Vice President for Operations of Lamsan Power Corporation. Take it away, Paul. You are now on live. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. In behalf of Lamson Power Corporation, I am Marov Andy from LPC's 15 megawatt biomass power plant. Together with me are our company's assistant vice president, Mr. Emerald Gabatilla, our plant manager, Mr. Jeme Lalau, and our electrical and instrumentation maintenance head, Mr. Patrick Kang. So before we begin with our presentation, may I introduce to you our AVP for Operations, Engineer Emerald Gabatilla, the representative of our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Christopher Lu, for a short introductory message. All right. Uh, before to present our presentation, I would like to have some courtesy to our beloved Minda Secretary, Chairman Manny Pinyol, BRMM, Menry Secretary Mokakua, ERC Commission, Commissioner Agnes Divanadera, distinguished guests and participants, good afternoon. On behalf of Lamsan Power Corporation and Sir Chris, we are grateful for inviting us in the forum to show for what LPC is and what Lamsan can do to support the farm government and the rest of Mindanao Island. Thank you also for the opportunity to share with you how COVID-19 affected us and these trials serve as an opportunity to correct our plans and bring us to rebuild a strong foundation and ready for the next trial ahead. 
to become resilient and exist for the next generation with a better one. Again, thank you very much to be part of Mindanao Development. Andy, can we present the presentation? Thank you very much, sir. So our presentation is divided into two. The first part is a video presentation which showcases generally the power plants of Lamson Group of Companies. After this video presentation, we also have a short PowerPoint presentation which tackles the company's response to COVID-19 and the challenges and impact of COVID-19 to the plant's operation. So without further ado, let us start with our presentation. Hi, Maru. It's not coming yes, online. Sir, can you see the presentation? No, sorry. Uh, I, uh, sorry, sir. I forgot to share screen. Oh, yes, please. please. Okay, can be seen now, but there's no audio. There you go, there's audio, thank you. Can I confirm, sir, if you hear the audio? It's a bit on the low side, so if you can increase the audio a bit, that would be most appreciated, thank you. Can I confirm, sir, if you hear the audio? Excuse me, sir. Hi, sir. The audio is barely audible. Um, mahira po siya, ano? Pakinggan? Uh, oh, okay, sir. I'll just start, sir. Yeah, I'll just reshare it and then make sure that you uh, check that box uh, to... Uh, no, that's okay. Yeah, for for the audio. I think I done it correctly. Yes, sir. The audio is good. Thank you very much. Lamsan Power Corporation is the renewable energy unit of the Lamsan Group of Companies. It was recently established to take part in the government's initiative to promote the use of renewable resources in generating power as well as support the Bangsamoro region by investing right at the heart of one of the most marginalized regions in the country. The company traces its roots from Lamsan Incorporated, which, since the early 80s, had developed the capacity to use biomass as an energy source, initially as a boiler fuel to produce steam for its corn wet milling plant. It operated a German standard Kessel Rice Husk fired process steam boiler for over 30 years. This operation gave them the experience and a track record in buying rice husk from local suppliers. Since the company offered a fair price for what was considered a waste byproduct of rice milling, the company did not have a problem in sourcing enough rice husk for its operations. The success of the rice husk fired boiler gave Lamsan Incorporated the confidence to start their own biomass cogeneration system in 2008, a system that produces both steam and power for the plant. At this time, Mindanao was having power supply problems during the summer months. Power costs were also increasing which made self-generation a viable option for the company, while at the same time addressing the growth requirement of steam and power for its expanding operations. Through these events, the management established an island-based power generating plant 
with a boiler capacity of 35 tons per hour and power generating unit capacity of 3.5 megawatts. It then expanded to the now 15 megawatt power plant, which feeds power to the Mindanao grid and a second cogeneration plant with a 5.5 megawatt, 42.4 tons per hour capacity that will supply power and process steam to the new corn wet milling plant. All these are carbon neutral sources of power generated from renewable organic waste. The main processes of the biomass power generation are fuel handling, fuel combustion, and ash handling. Incoming deliveries are weighed using platform scales with digital weight indicators that can transmit data across all weighing scales in the complex. Weighed and classified deliveries are unloaded in different warehouses for proper storage. Fuel is transported to the boiler through the fuel handling system, which has a capacity of 20 tons per hour for rice husk and 11 tons per hour for other biomass fuel. At the boiler section, fuel is burned to produce the required steam and power. The generated steam passes through steam separators to ensure purity while power is generated by the 15 MW Steam Turbine Generator or STG with a voltage output of 13.8 kV. This power is fed to the NGCP grid through the switch shard. Fly ash from the boiler or furnace tank are conveyed by a dense phase pneumatic ash handling system to the ash silo that has a capacity of 130 cubic meters. Release of ash to the environment is controlled through the electrostatic precipitator or ESP, an air pollution control device which filters fine particles before the excess fumes of the plant are emitted to the atmosphere. All power plant equipment are controlled and monitored at the control room through a distributed control system or DCS. The DCS architecture around the plant is an efficient way to ensure reliability of process control, product quality, and plant efficiency. With the operation of three biomass-fired power plants, the company added value to agricultural waste from rice husk, corn cobs, sawdust, and wood chips, it now buys palm empty fruit bunch and coffee husk. Materials that were considered before as waste now have value since the company started buying them. These materials, with delivery quantities ranging from 90 to 120 truckloads daily, are sourced from the provinces of Maguindanao, South Cotabato, and North Cotabato. With the increasing requirement for biomass fuel, Procurement reached as far as the provinces of Bukidnon, Lanao del Norte, and even Zamboanga del Sur. To forestall possible fuel shortage and ensure continuous operations, the Lamsan Group went into neighbor gas farming, giving rise to Magindanao Energy Farms Incorporated. Uh, that is um, uh, a tax lang ako. Pagka nung natoto na ako, sir, Ang um, nag-idea na ako, nag-start ako noong 2014 hanggang ngayon. Katulad sir ng ano, uh, rice ash, uh, palm empty bands, corn cabs, uh, carburized cocoa cell, sawdust. Aside sa boiler fuel, nagsusupla rin ako ng yellow corn. Uh, mostly sa South Cotabato, Surala, like Santo Nino, uh, Takorong, Isolan. Pero meron din ako from North Cotabato, like Makilala, uh, Mati Dabo Oriental, and Tagong. Uh, tinatapon, minsan sinusunog eh. Nabigyan ng hanap ko yung mga ng trabaho, like labor works, nagsasaking, loading, at mga at mga helper, maraming pamilya ang natutulungan. All these developments, in turn, provided extra income to rice mill owners, business opportunities for truckers, and additional livelihood for farmers and laborers. And with Napier grass farming, untapped land areas in Maguindanao are put into good use and road infrastructure projects were completed. The Lamsan Group, driven by its continuing commitment and belief in the potential of the Bangsamoro region and its people. Continue to invest 
and give back to the community by providing stable and gainful employment, livelihood, and business opportunities and infrastructure programs. Lamsan as a group has always been using uh, biomass since the 80s. We always believe that uh, we have to protect the environment. Therefore, we try our best to use uh, safe technologies, clean technologies in uh, expanding our businesses. So further, while we think of the future of BARM, perhaps uh, LPC or Lamsan Power are, is uh, considering putting up more power plants to help support the power requirements of the BARM government. Lamsan Power Corporation, leading the way to clean, sustainable, and renewable energy for the Bangsamoro. Thank you very much, sir, for watching. Let us now proceed with our PowerPoint presentation. Our PowerPoint presentation is all about the response of our company to COVID-19 and the impacts of COVID-19 to, to our company's operations. Coronavirus disease 2019, per commonly known as COVID-19, has undeniably affected the lives of most people in the planet. People got sick, lost their jobs, and worse, lost their loved ones. Some businesses downsized, and many had to close, especially small-scale businesses. The Lamson Group of Companies is one of the few who, despite the difficulties brought about by the pandemic, was able to continue operations and provide livelihood to many Filipinos here in Maguindanao. The company's first response is to set up a COVID-19 monitoring team, which is composed of our safety group and HR support. Some of the team's main task is to create the company's COVID-19 prevention guidelines and business continuity plan and monitor IATF and LGU orders concerning COVID-19. The main goal of our response to COVID-19 is to protect our business and the employees. By doing so, we can protect also our stakeholders. The company initially drafted the COVID-19 prevention guidelines, which is based on the government's minimum health standard protocols, like properly wearing of face masks and face shields, providing hand washing stations in each of the sections of the company, thermal scanning, providing foot bath in the main gate and on building entrances, strictly implementing physical distancing in workplace, canteen and service vehicles and regular disinfection of our workplace. We also adopted flexible work arrangements like work from home, stay in and work rotation for our employees. We also limited the activities which can contribute to the spread of COVID-19, like accepting visitors, face-to-face -face meetings, and other large gatherings. We also utilize our gymnasium for recruitment and other unavoidable meetings and trainings. We also subdivided our offices to limit exposures of employees with, it, with each other. For employees exposed to COVID-19 positive patients and with influenza-like illness symptoms, we advise them to self-isolate and will conduct rapid tests upon their return to work. For the impact of COVID-19 to the company, Additional expenses were spent, like for providing PPEs to employees, purchase of sanitizing agents, salary for employees on quarantine due to exposure at work, purchase of additional service vehicles to make sure physical distancing is being observed in our buses, and the company is also planning to purchase COVID-19 vaccines. During the peak of the lockdowns implemented by LGUs, the company also experienced delayed in operations like hampered delivery of boiler feedstock, delayed shipment of materials and travel restrictions affecting arrival of suppliers and technicians. This was during the preliminary implementation of travel restrictions where the rules and guidelines were not yet clear. However, if there is one thing that made big impact in plants operations, that is the implementation of lockdown and community quarantine by different LGUs. In our case, Last year, April 2020, our customer Sokoteco 2 requested us for power supply reduction. 
So instead of providing them 13.5 megawatt of electricity, we're only providing them 7 megawatt every 11 p.m. to 7 a.m., or equivalent to eight hours a day. This is due to low demand of energy because of the movement restrictions implemented by LGUs. For the impact of COVID-19 to our employees, reduced income whenever they are on quarantine or suspension, additional tasks like, tasks like monitoring personnel's health condition, contract, contact tracing, and monitoring observance of COVID-19 guidelines. There is also strains in work-life balance like limited interaction with co-employees, friends, and other family members, and an avails incentive leaves for vacation. Employees also experience stress due to fear of contracting the disease at work and infecting the, their own family, and also anxiety and thinking when will everything go back to normal. The company, however, believe, believes that its employees are its greatest asset. So in response to that, the company provides health and psychosocial interventions to employees like employee consultation and participating to different seminars about coping with stress and building mental health. That is the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maruf and uh, Lamsan team. Thank you for sharing that video and the many initiatives you did. Uh, we hope to see you in the near future. Keep going. Now, uh, we've ended all the presentations and uh, certainly we are pressed for time and we're on the hour. It's already 3, 4 p.m. And this is what we'll do. We'll go straight away to the reaction of our panelists. I'll be asking each one of our dear panelists to uh, share their rejoinder or comment to all the presentations. And then hopefully some of your comments in the chat box will be addressed. If not, then uh, we will take up a few that would be of concern to the bigger group because certain concerns are quite specific and would be documented and relate to the uh, uh, party that is uh, meant to. Uh, also, there are uh, certain uh, points raised in the chat box that would be covered by the succeeding presentations, such as rural electrification and uh, uh, the, st the, the situation of uh, household electrification in the country as well as community-based electrification. So on that note, uh, I would like to ask our dear panelists, uh, looking back at all the very uh, comprehensive and meaningful presentations to share their thoughts. And of course, I would uh, like to start with our uh, dear Undersecretary Manuel Juanesa. Sir, please. Yes, uh, this is uh, Yusek Juanesa. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Gagliardo. Yes, May I, I was in another meeting actually with, uh, you know, the, may I uh, know what's the uh, question? Sir, if, if I may just uh, mention uh, what concerns uh, clustered on specific major themes, so we won't be going into specific questions, I, okay. like, like on the matter of uh, demand and supply, uh, there were many discuss discussions on that matter. There seems to be an impression that there is a priority dispatch on coal vis-a-vis -vis, uh, more affordable hydro. And uh, could you enlighten us a bit on this matter? Uh, because that seemed to have uh, sort of trended in the chat box. Um, another one would be on RE, on incentives and the directions uh in the near future so those are the two major topics the last one the last cluster sir uh, i think would be covered in the next sessions on rural electrification okay. uh, thank you on the uh, question of uh, uh, dispatching uh, protocols or priorities uh, like uh, coal versus uh, renewable energy in general terms and uh, one of the uh, considerations we have actually, uh, we have a, uh, a dispatching uh, protocol that uh, our uh, system operator and our market market uh, operator has to uh, to follow, and uh, and this is also based on the uh, the uh, category of. Uh, of uh, load that 
the uh, certain uh, power plant is having a bilateral contract or a PSA. For example, uh, if it is a base load uh, uh, requirement and uh, in, in terms of uh, the protocol, the uh, call you know, is uh, considered as the, uh, the base load uh, power plant. However, uh, with the advent of uh, our renewable energy uh, uh, aggressiveness that we have to uh, to give, you know, uh, a uh, share of uh, our our demand in Mindanao to uh, the renewable energy. Uh, we are actually looking at uh, various mechanisms that we have for renewable energy uh, so that they can be dispatched uh, by the uh, by the market operator and the system operator on the second question on uh, on benefits i think one of the questions uh, relates to something like uh, tax incentives and uh, and uh, the uh, Department of Energy, firstly, the Renewable Energy Act of uh, 2008 uh, provides already you know, incentives for the, uh, for the investors on renewable uh, energy uh, uh, investors, uh, power plant investors, and also the, uh, the uh, recently uh, passed uh, create law uh, would further actually uh, give benefits to to the investors uh, like power 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 sector investors uh, who would be deciding to uh, install or erect a constructor uh, power plant outside like ncr so uh, these are, you know, uh, some of the incentives that are already in place, and also the uh, board of investment. Uh, ha the investors know that they already have such uh, such uh, incentives. However, still the DOE is looking at other ways of uh, perhaps uh, enhancing. Uh, we we cannot commit anything at the moment because. Uh, uh, those uh, probable potential uh, uh, points uh, for uh, the investors are still being uh, reviewed by our internal uh, economist and our LS legal legal team. Uh, on the uh, third question, uh, well, what's the third question? Uh, sorry, I. I sorry. It it's it's more on rural electrification, ah, rural electrification. Sure that, although that will that will be covered later sir more comprehensively but yeah. you you might have some points on that matter rural uh, electrification uh, if we look at the uh, the different uh, uh, categories of uh, rural electrification uh, we have you know the uh, the underserved, unserved, where we have actually a program for QTP, which we call it uh, qualified third party provider. And uh, our NPC, uh, who's handling the NPC SPAG or the, the underserved, unserved areas where electric operatives, for example, in the off grid, of course, are not able to, uh, to develop uh, due to certain uh, constraints. Uh, these areas are uh, are uh, waived by the uh, franchise holders, and then it goes through a process of uh, CSP or uh, a competitive selection process. And uh, about uh, three three months ago, we have uh, actually uh, been studying on uh, and encouraging our uh, electric cooperatives to. Uh, to waive, you know, uh, areas where they believe uh, they cannot electrify, given you know the uh, circumstances uh, that uh, financing and capex and uh, all those things uh, put into uh, one basket. 
So uh, uh, that's one of the actions for rural electrification. At the same time, we have our uh, our uh, support uh, coming from our EU ASEP, uh, and they are also you know supportive to uh, rural electrification on the. The DOE as well, uh, like uh, last week, we had internal meeting and we're looking at other ways of uh, getting, you know, funds for uh, rural electrification, most likely for the uh, PDM uh, or the uh, solar home systems. So these are all, you know, in, in the uh, in the pipelines uh, to really reinforce uh, our uh, rural electrification programs. And uh, if I may speak for a bit for uh, NEA, because uh, I sit as alternate chair for the NEA board, we actually have uh, a, a proposal uh, uh, to for the 2022 budget. Uh, we ask for uh, additional funds for uh, rural electrification and missionary electrification for electric cooperatives through the uh, 2022 uh, budget proposal. So, uh, with the uh, with the expectation and with the uh, direction coming from uh, Secretary Kusi and of course from the President himself, uh, being from Mindanao, uh, and also in a, it's not just because it's Mindanao, but uh, we're looking at uh, uh, hitting our target. You know, uh, in terms of rural electrification. As everybody knows, the uh, the Barm area has, I think, uh, only has the lowest of uh, of the uh, uh, or has more uh, households to be electrified or to be uh, supplied with uh, electric power. So those are uh, the NEA is looking at that, and also uh, in the NPC, in the National National Power Corporation, the the SPAG is also strongly uh, doing you know uh, procurement uh, for hybridized uh, uh, power uh, supply system in uh, in uh, off grid areas so that, that's uh, the general perspective as far as uh, as uh, rural electrification is concerned thank you thank you Yusek Kwanesa and, for those uh, valuable inputs if, and responses yeah. If I, if I may interrupt, uh, may I be excused from this meeting? Because I, I have actually an ongoing <laughs> meeting on the other side. Uh, it has to do with uh, Thank you, sir. Ne Negros Panay uh, power supply as well. Oh. oh uh, anyhow, uh, as Asik Red mentioned yep. uh, in our internal uh, discussions, uh, all other questions we will answer or reply these questions uh, that are you know, in the chat box. Okay. So, thank you very much. Dagang, sir. That dagang would be most appreciated. Thank you. Uh, dagang salamat po. Mayong mayong hapon po sa inyo. So, yeah. If I if I thank be you, sir, permitted to leave, yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now let's thank you, sir. Now let's proceed the, uh, directly to our the rest of our panelists and just to mention the key points on RE. Uh, there are questions on are there incentives for company or households going to renewable energy? And how about the centralized microgrids? Are we seriously pursuing them, especially if we want to increase the share of RE in the total mix? So I'll now open the floor to the rest of our uh, panelists. I'll start with uh, Director Sharon of the Energy Regulatory Commission followed by Sir Chola of NREB, and then, of course, Engineer Ronald of USAID ESP. Director Sharon, kindly start the uh, final uh, lap of our discussions for this session. Okay, thank you, Anne, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting us to this forum. We'd like to thank Minda for that. And um, just a, a reaction on all the presentations before, before me. Um, I would like to echo what Chair said earlier this morning that um, it has been the mantra of ERC ever since the pandemic to deal with the new normal and to create a new normal environment. So um, we have been doing that in ERC. In fact, um, in, in my department um, on the issuance of the certificate of compliance for all these generation companies, 
um, the physical inspection, which uh, we which is required before the issuance of the COC, is now converted into a virtual inspection, and um, we have also opened the platform for online online filing for this, and um, it has been raised earlier on the IPO issue, and um, for the GenCos, we have been very strict on the compliance of these GenCos to the public offering requirement, and so we have not been issuing COC to GenCos who are not compliant. We only issue a provisional authority to operate conditioned on strict compliance to the IPO. Now, on the WSM Mindanao, um, as uh, mentioned by Chair earlier, we have um, made a lot of effort to ensure that uh, to to help the Department of Energy ensure that um, registration will be completed by all the participants, and we have issued several letters and a follow up letter, and uh, also organized the forum with the D with the DUs with the Mindanao DUs on April 20, 2021. Uh, this was also attended by the Department of Energy, PEMC, NEA. We even invited AMRECO and Filreca. So we will continue to um, monitor compliance of these um, stakeholders, the DUs and the embedded generators to the WSM uh, registration. Now, um, earlier, there was also a mention of ARCOA in Mindanao. Um, we are geared to implementing that as well. We are just waiting for WESEM to be implemented in Mindanao. In fact, uh, based on um, our database shows, uh, there's a total of 167 contestable customers in Mindanao um, from phases one, two, and three. Okay. Um, next on the RE, uh, the feed-in tariff, there were questions on feed-in tariff earlier. For Mindanao, there are um, two solar power plants, three biomass plants, and three runoff river hydropower plants that made it to the feed-in tariff. And um, during the pandemic, the commission has suspended the collection of the fit all for the months of March and April 2020 to provide relief to the consumers. And just recently, we have issued a moratorium on the um, interest and the penalty for um, non-payment or incomplete payment of the fit revenue of the GENCOS. This will be from the February to uh, billing of Transco until a period of six months. Now, there were also um, issues raised on the net metering. Um, the commission um, issued uh, ERC resolution number six series of 2019 to improve the net metering rules. And the amended net metering rules, in fact, it improved the interconnection setup to take advantage of the new technology and to implement the RPS. It um, also simplified permitting schedule so that um, the processing by the DUs of the net metering application should only be 20 days. We also, um, in that amended net metering rules, reduced installation soft costs. We have removed the DIS fee um, imposition and the net metering charge that the, the net metering customers um, see in their bills. We also maintain the current pricing, but uh, this is mainly to minimize the impact to the non-net metering customers. We likewise address the subsidy impact on the non-net metering customers. We rationalize the entitlement to lifeline subsidy rates so that um, those enjoying the the those who are under the net metering rules, if um, so uh, warranted, will not be able to avail of the lifeline subsidy rates if they are they do not belong to the marginalized group. We also opened opportunities for socialized and economic housing developments to avail of the net metering program. So as of April um, 30, 2021, 53 DUs have net metering customers or are implementing net metering in their respect, respective franchise areas for a total capacity of 33,106 kilowatt peak and a total of 4,117 qualified end users. In Mindanao, um, out of the 33 DUs, um, only nine DUs have net metering customers for a total capacity of 1,386 kilowatt peak. And, um, that's uh, for 116 qualified end users. And we will um, we have started um, information campaign 
we, before the pandemic, we have um, a program for info campaign to capacitate the use and also to inform customers. And um, however, this did not push through because of the pandemic, but um, we're getting back to it. We're just um, prioritizing the ARCOA in Luzon. We have um, the contestable customers info awareness capacity uh, activity since May up to July twice a month and um, after that we will go into the full blast info campaign on the net metering. Okay, um, now um, the gains of the RE Act should continue and on the JOP as um, announced by Chair earlier, the Commission has already approved the regulatory framework for JOP and uh, the next will be the RPS cost recovery rules which we already have a draft and the technical team is ready now to present to the Commission. So far, those are um, the updates that we have for, for this forum. And thank you, everyone, and um, the ERC uh, in balancing the interest of all industry stakeholders is also supportive of the objective of this uh, forum, which is a sustainable and more resilient Mindanao. Salamat. Salamat, Director Sharon, for very specific updates. Uh, they are most appreciated. Your presence here is most appreciated. Thank you. And you, with your kind permission, I'll now proceed to Sir Cholo of NREB. Sir, uh, rejoinder or reaction on the presentations, or you might want to respond to the specific uh, questions. Well, let, me start with, let me start with something from the presentations, okay? And it may help answer some of the questions that were raised, right? Um, one of the presentations said that, you know, there are indications that uh, of... Uh, well, potential uh, capacity that will be built in Mindanao, representing 66% of uh, future capacity indicated. Um, I just want to mention that capacity figures are very, very misleading when it comes to actual share of RE. Um, you know, um, a lot of the uh, technologies that we're looking at now, like for example, solar, Solar has, let's just say, around 17% uh, capacity factor versus, uh, you know, over 80% for some of the uh, fossil fuel plants. Now, uh, granted, uh, uh, geothermal and, uh, and uh, biomass plants have a much higher capacity factor, uh, but, you know, uh, they're all, well, Biomass is limited by uh, its source of fuel and uh, um, geothermal by, well, the resource availability, you know. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, I'm not sure whether even if those 66% are built, how much of the share of, uh, uh, of the future uh, generation in Mindanao, actual energy, will be RE, right? And... Going back to, well, how come we've lagged behind after, let's say, 12 years after the RE Act? Um, with all the incentives, with all the, uh, you know, the uh, programs, a lot of the programs still have to be put in place. Uh, the, it, you know, I was uh, wondering, for example, why in 2010 uh, we've, we rushed the uh, uh, implementation of the FIT program, uh, whereas we could have also done the RPS program at that time. Um, I'm not sure, you know, what the rate impacts would have been either way, but uh, it's interesting to note that in 2010, the cheapest of the five uh, FIT eligible technologies was hydro. Uh, and then fast forward to today, uh, of all the uh, installation targets, uh, hydro is the only one that hasn't been completed. Everybody else is fully subscribed. Is that a rate issue? Uh, is that does that have something to do with uh, uh, problems related to building the the uh, plants or permitting? Uh, I think maybe it's a little of, it, of all of that. Uh, and it's interesting to note that perhaps you know to build a small hydro plant, uh, the requirements to build it in terms of Permitting, including getting, uh, uh, you know, your your uh, clearances or approvals from the uh, indigenous people uh, in 
many of the locations where hydro uh, resources are located um, make it very, very difficult and make it a long and tedious process, even compared to large uh, uh, conventional power plants. No? So that has something to do with it. Now, I think somebody asked the question about are there benefits uh, directly to the customers? Unfortunately, the, the benefit is indirect. The, the um, hydro, sorry, not hydro, but all RE plants are supposed to be uh, VAT zero rated. That means in theory, the customer should save 12% uh, the, the, the VAT equivalent, right? Um, to a certain extent, it's translated in the rates because it's average. Uh, but the only people who can really take full advantage of that are residential customers because for, uh, for industrial customers, well, many of them, uh, the VAT they can use as an input. So, you know, uh, whether they pay uh, VAT or not, you know, really is immaterial in, 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 in this case to them, right? It's, it's not a direct cost. It's something that can be passed on. Um, but for the residential customers, yes, it is. Uh, there was a time many years ago when we tried uh, uh, to find a way where that could be um, directly enjoyed by, uh, by residential customers. And um, we couldn't find a way with the ERC because the, the currently the manner in which uh, uh, generation uh, costs are passed on is it's average to all customers. Okay. I hope that answers some of the questions. Thank you, Sir Cholo. Indeed, a lot of moving parts, no one says ramifications, many things to consider. It's not as simple as we hope it would be renewable energy uh, development. And uh, for our last uh, reaction, I would now call uh, engineer Ronald Dabad of USAID Energy Secure Philippines activity. Ronald, please. Hi, thank you, M. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to say something about the Mindanao power situation. Um, I remember that about 20, 12 years ago, uh, Mindanao is highly dependent on a single source of uh, power, which is basically hydro. Now, it's really a good thing right now that the 12 years after, uh, the, the, there's already a good generation mix uh, in the in the power uh, uh, in the now power situation right now, no, and uh, the good thing is that uh, we have enough reserve for us to cope up with uh, what happened at the pandemic due to the delays of the development or construction of the other uh, power generations. So with that, at least uh, Mindanao was able to cope up with that, no, and right now this is really the best time to to further develop the renewable energy as we are all gearing up on that one. And, uh, but we have to remember all the experiences that we had in the past in Luzon and Visayas, wherein we have to make sure that uh, we're not just um, developing different kinds of uh, renewable energy without looking into the reserve market also. So with that, um, in terms of uh, the developments, we're already there. Um, and uh, we just need to wait some more, ha have uh, some more patience. And uh, we know that uh, the, the, the power sectors are doing their best in order to, to cope up with this. No? And uh, with regards to the, the next steps that we're looking at, of course, everybody's waiting for the implementation of the WESM which basically would uh, help uh, understand uh, basically the, the, how much electricity would cost really. Okay, so that's it, Ben. Sir Enrique, you're still on mute. Oh, my apologies. 
Yeah, there you go. Uh, sorry, uh, we're pressed for time, so we have to wrap up the discussions now. Very good. And, and there are so many concerns right. to, to be addressed, and uh, be assured that the, the requirements and the questions and the comments are being documented. And as you said, Kwan, as I said, uh, we'll look into them. And on that note, I would like to thank our dear panelists, of course, Yusek Kwanesa, Director Sharon, uh, Mr. Bernard, Engineer Ronald, thank you for your time. And to our speakers uh, from DOE, Selena, uh, Headcore, Agus Pulangi, First Gen, and Lamsan, uh, and MFO, of course, uh, DOE MFO. Thank you very much. And on that note, and I'll now turn it over back to Sir Raymond. Sir, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sir Enrique. Okay, okay. Uh, for handling that and uh, the, the, the um, mock secretary discussion. Yes, sec many mock. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yes, I would like to acknowledge uh, the you know, secretary. Comment, no? uh, because uh, our chat box actually is being bombarded with messages asking for Minda's position on uh, the issue of. Uh, the uh, privatization of the uh, Agus Pulangi hydroelectric complex. And uh, I was briefed by uh, ASEC uh, Romeo Montenegro that Minda had already previously submitted a position on this matter. And the position of Minda on this matter was uh, that it is recommending or it recommended that the uh, Agus Pulangi should uh, remain under the ownership and control of uh, government. And uh, to that I agree. That is my personal position. Uh, I also would like to share with you a uh, sad experience that we have uh, or we had in North Cotabato regarding uh, privatization of uh, very critical uh, energy facilities. You know, sometime in the 1980s, uh, the uh, Department of Energy, uh, through the uh, uh, intercession of uh, several officials, convinced the people of the province of North Cotabato to uh, utilize 704 hectares of uh, the Mount Apo Natural Park for the uh, development of uh, a geothermal facility in spite of the opposition of some uh, groups, uh, the uh, provincial government was convinced because uh, they were promised that uh, Cotabato would have a sufficient supply of uh, power and that there would be a direct, direct transmission line from uh, Paco substation, which is near Mount Apo, to the uh, first district of North Cotabato. Well, those promises were never fulfilled. Sad thing is, in the previous administration, shortly before the end of their term, the uh, Mount Apo Geothermal, which was operated by the Energy Development Corporation, was sold to the private sector. And uh, I don't know what, what would happen, what would be the implications of that sale to the previous commitments made by government uh, to the stakeholders of North Cotabato. And maybe it is because of this sad experience that uh, any move towards privatizing very critical facilities like uh, Agus Polangi and others should go through a thorough uh, consultation process and study. Especially so since uh, power is very critical to the uh, development and economic empowerment of Mindanao. So I'm sharing this uh, insight so that people will understand where I, Chairman of the Mindanao Development Authority, uh, am coming from uh, in as far as uh, the privatization issue is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Pinyol, for uh, addressing that issue to the point very clearly. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, you heard it from Secretary Pinyol himself okay so we are maintaining that course and such we will now be proceeding um it's already 3 37 in the afternoon we shall now be proceeding to the uh second set of panel discussions um 
Okay, um, the discussion for the next set is the uh, Crisanto Lasset of Energy Secure Philippines. And together with Director Sharon Montanier of the Marketing Operations Service of the Energy Regulatory Commission, we also have um, ASEC Redentor de Lola, or ASEC Red of the Department of Energy. Um, we also have, as another panelist, Engineer Adolfo L. Mirasol, from, also from USA Energy Secure <laughs> Philippines. Okay, so we're going to have two panel presenters. Uh, for Wesem Mindanao, we have Engineer Isidro E. Cacho. The Head of Corporation Strategy and Communications of the Independent Electricity Market Operator of the Philippines, or IEMO. And we also have a, a resource speaker from the National Grid Corporation of the Philippines. We have Mr. Reddy Alan B. Remorosa, the AVP and Head of Transmission Planning Department. Um, sir? Sir Chris, yes, you may uh, now take take over the discussion. Uh, Raymond, that do that do I get did I get it right? The first speaker should be NGCP. Yes, sir. Okay, see so yeah. to save to save a little time, I just state that we will have the same procedure here. The speakers will complete their presentations. Uh, in the meantime, we're taking notes of your questions. Uh, so may we now call on Mr. Reddy Alan. Remorosa, Head of Transmission Planning Department, to discuss the Mindanao Transmission Development Plan. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us in this um, Mindanao Power Forum 2021. And we are pleased to provide you a brief presentation on the Transmission Development Plan for the Mindanao Grid. So on this uh, first slide, we are showing an overview of our existing power system in, the, in Mindanao with our highest transmission voltage at 230 kV, most of our backbone facilities at 138 kV, and of course the various 69 kV facilities um, serving the distribution um, utilities. And let me uh, proceed with the next one. What we have here is this, um, a grid map of the map of Mindanao showing the load distribution. So this is the darker um, areas are those with heavier load relative to the lighter shaded uh, areas. So the, um, the load centers in Davao, Jensen, Cagayan de Oro, and uh, also in Sambuanga, and we are also highlighting here the location of the existing bulk generation sites represented by these uh, circles. So the um, one of our key uh, points in our presentation is uh, on the location of future power plants that will come in in uh, Mindanao. We are uh, promoting the location or uh, the, the location here in Samwanga as well as uh, on this side in Sorigao, this part of the grid, to be a location of uh, future power plant uh, developments. With this uh, more distributed uh, generation uh, location, that will be very beneficial for the total system of Mindanao to have more flexible, resilient, and smarter grid. Of course, we understand there are various considerations in siting a power plant, but uh, our recommendation is on uh, exploring um, locating power plants in these areas, thereby minimizing uh, import of power from bulk generation sites. That, that is, as we move forward um, in, the, in the development of this system. So the other slides are were presented already earlier here. Uh, the message is the reduction only of the uh, peak demand, projected peak demand as a result of COVID-19. And um, of course, as we have the, uh, in the coming years, we are expecting update as well in this uh, projection. 
And uh, the by year 2025, comparing the previous forecast by the DOE and the new forecast uh, issued in August last year, this is lower already by, by uh, 409 uh, megawatts. Uh, this is our version to, to show the demand and supply comparison in the Mindanao grid. This is the, the peak load in 2025 represented by this um, red bar. And this portion represents the reserve level requirement. This is 2025, this is 2030. And we have here the existing uh, generation capacity in Mindanao. This is the uh, uh, existing and this portion is for the committed uh, power plant capacity. This is based on DOE data. Uh, I think as of August 2020. And um, direct comparison of the 20, uh, 2030 requirement, we will uh, certainly need additional uh, generation for the Mindanao grid in the coming years. While initially we have uh, excess that may be exported to other parts of the grid, especially with the completion of the Mindanao Visayas interconnection by 2022. And based on the data from the Department of Energy, we have this much uh, capacity of proposals. And we are just showing here briefly the, uh, the type of power plants um, for this total of 2,746, which are presently uh, classified as still uh, indicative. Bulk expected from coal, followed by solar, and then the hydro. Now let's uh, have a quick look on the development plans in, in Mindanao. Here, um, let me start with this uh, side in Sambuanga. We have uh, the uh, proposed project subject to ERC approval, the extension of the 230 kV backbone up to this part of Sambuanga. While we are uh, proposing this uh, 230 kV backbone uh, extension, we are continuously promoting uh, power plant uh, developments here that will significantly um, improve the uh, flexibility, resiliency of this part of the network. And uh, in each, uh, while this will take some time for the new 230 kV uh, backbone that will have more than 250 kilometers line of new right of way, the immediate measure would be the installation of the um, reactive support equipment, capacitors, and statcom. And in other parts of the grid, we have uh, projects extending the uh, the 200 or the 138 kV backbone. We have the proposed uh, looping of the 69 in this part of uh, the grid. Also in this side, extension of the 138 kV backbone, completion of the looping of the 69 kV. So we, we understand there are uh, many 69 kV facilities that have not been uh, divested and the uh, NGCP will continue uh, implementation of projects that will address the heavy loading conditions for the 69 kV. One part here is the extension of 138 kV up to this location. And we are uh, considering this higher capacity backbone as uh, in support for the long-term load growth in the in the area, so I, I'll not be discussing each and every project. The uh, uh, the other highlight uh, project here is the Mindanao Visayas interconnection. Earlier in the DOE presentation, um, it was shown that the updated target in view of the COVID and the issue in the South Marine uh, uh, incident is December 2022, but NGCP is still um, um, targeting um, as the earliest possible uh, completion for this important link to connect Mindanao to the rest of the grid, which will provide uh, opportunities both for the generation and also the deuse uh, in both sides of the grid. And uh, so the, the target is uh, March 2022. 
there are other uh, continuing developments focusing on the establishment of um, new biologies. So you will uh, note here, uh, aside from the extension of 230 KV to Sambuanga, looping of the 230 KV uh, facilities in this side of the grid that will, um, um, this looping configuration will provide operational uh, flexibility in our system. And of course, even on this side, the, the plan to extend as reinforcement to the existing 138 kV uh, backbone system is a 230 kV uh, corridor in this um, eastern part of the Mindanao grid. Overall, what we are seeing are uh, completion in the up to the 2040 period, completion of the backbone looping configurations. We are extending uh, 230 kV as well as 138 kV um, and more 69 kV line uh, developments. Also, there are proposed island interconnections, including uh, this island in Basilan and other islands in uh, Mindanao. Moving on, this is on our other plans and programs as regards uh, resiliency. Uh, here, this is focusing more on the use of upgraded uh, wind speed design for our new transmission uh, facilities. Um, this is more critical for the case of Visayas and Mindanao uh, being visited more frequently by typhoons. And uh, there will be updates, upgrade of the old lines that will be uh, implemented stage by stage. One important, uh, I already uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the improvement in the resiliency will be uh, achieved through the establishment of transmission backbone loop configuration. And uh, the third one is on the selection of the substation site as well as transmission line route to avoid the um, hazards. And the good thing is, is that there are many references for the uh, fault line maps as well as flooding maps that will aid in uh, selecting carefully the location of the new facilities to be installed in our system. And uh, finally, for the smart grid um, strategies, last year the Department of Energy has issued a circular on the national smart grid uh, policy framework. And there are uh, many things to be undertaken but to give you an overview on the NGCP's um, strategies, we are doing in parallel these activities, focusing on transformation. So we, we will continue the transmission backbone developments, new corridors, addressing also the issues on the aging uh, transmission facilities um, nationwide, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. Uh, in addition to continuous improvement of the physical uh, system is internally we are we have started activities in consolidating our existing automatic uh, systems it is more of a part of the preparation uh, as we move towards the smart grid uh, development so we have uh, uh, the application of advanced ICT information and communication and technology and another Another critical uh, item as regards smart grid that will need um, further collaboration among the energy players, not only transmission, but including the power plants and the distribution utilities to ensure that in the future we can have uh, interoperability. And that will be achieved through the establishment of smart grid, of a common smart grid technical standards that will be adopted here in the Philippines. Uh, this is my uh, final slide. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, we've seen from the presentation that we have really we have a real game changer here in in the plants for Mindanao. We have a two we have the two thirty kV backbone transmission line. 
We've always known that the eastern part of the island, even if connected with several 138 KV lines, counting the Bislig link, was considered a weak electrical link. The 230 KV backbone will change the way the trans transmission system will be uh, is will uh, will change the way the trans transmission system is operated. Uh, considering what we've seen in the slide, the low distribution and generate generator locations in the grid. Parang it it just seems like a a, a triangle from from Iligan to somewhere in Aplaya and and maybe Kebawe or Pulangi. The the backbone will still play a big role in exploring Sambuanga and the Surigao areas as new generation locations. Uh, more importantly, NGCP is still looking at extending the 230 kV backbone to Sambuanga. That that has been a long term dream, you no? Know, because really Sambuanga is very very far from from Iligan. But, uh, electrically. That's, that's really a, a great distance. And the last, not really the last, the, the e equivalent game changer is the submarine cable Mindanao Visayas interconnection. That, that fulfills the dream to have the one Philippine transmission grid. It's really easy to link the TDP to resiliency. Uh, infrastructure and structure strengthening addresses vulnerabilities of critical facilities that reduce reliability of service, substation looping for redundancies, system measures like flood control is low protection, increased availability, and smart grid initiatives and, in, and automation would make response and restoration of power grids uh, very quick. Um, th th that sums up my, my my uh, synopsis for for that presentation, but I've been pondering why the next topic, Western Mindanao, is clustered with the TDP. But first, uh, a short story. When Mindanao Western was introduced years back, it was quickly suspended. Only a few outside Mindanao knew that only the trading operations were suspended. The settlement protocol was kept in operation. The Mindanao supply sector opened and had operated using the dispatch protocol created by NGCP and the settlement protocol of QSM, which was used by PEMC in its role as a settlement agent. So the two initiatives of NGCP and, and PEMC allowed for physical delivery and financial settlement in an open access environment without the WSM in place. So thank you, Mr. Remosora, and, and to everyone, kindly hold your questions for later as we now have the next uh, presentation. May we call on Mr. Sid Cacho of IMAP to discuss the WSM Mindanao. Uh, yes, Noy, good afternoon. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, well, uh, before anything else, please allow me to say good afternoon to Secretary, Honorable Secretary Pinol, uh, to Yusek Wanesa, to, uh, of course, uh, uh, ASECIO, ASEC Red, and Director Montaner, and of, all, of course, all the panelists, discussants, and the attendees of this uh, Mindanao Forum. So, 